6 p.m. and I want to welcome everyone to the City of Iowa City formal work um, uh, formal agenda and I'm going to start with item number one which is roll call please Burgess here Mims here Salee here Taylor here Teague here Thomas here Weiner here Again, welcome to everyone that is uh, in the audience here and those that are virtually watching this. Um, today is a day that we had a little celebration um, from 4 p.m. until 5.30, celebrating two of the counselors that are here that have served Iowa City. And we have Counselor Susan Mims, who has served 12 years, and also our Mayor Pro Tem, Salee, who has served for four years. And I want to ask us all to give them a round of applause for their service. It is no easy task um, in, in their roles, and I know them both personally. Um, I'll say to Susan Mims, I really appreciate all of your investment in me here on City Council. It had um, really given me the 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 structure, uh, the basic foundation of learning the the agenda, what it all means. It wasn't easy, and I really appreciate you. I'll also uh, say when it comes down to the voters of Iowa City, they voted for you because they knew that you would represent them. And I think that was done three times, and that is a great accomplishment. And so I applaud you for that. And I know that there has been lots of sacrifices, um, both of you, uh, as you sit on the city council. And uh, the city of Iowa City do recognize your sacrifices. Mayor Pro Tem, you have been awesome and amazing, especially um, uh, these past uh, two years, especially. I think this community has seen uh, you in full force and, and how you advocate for the, those in our community. And on behalf of the city of Iowa City and this council, we appreciate you both. And we have some gifts for you as you part from this council. But we also know that you'll still be in the community and very much active in your own ways. And it gives the, your years of service, okay. and it also says, Mazahir uh, Salih, and your years of service. So thank you both again. Thank you. And I'll just, I'll, yeah, I'll give it to you now. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a little awkward, isn't it? <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. We're going to move on to items number two through seven. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by? Moved by, by Weiner. Weiner. Moved by Weiner. I couldn't, I just heard voices. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And would anyone from the public like to address a topic? With, which is on the consent agenda. And we do have a sign-up sheet over there, and we ask that people, when they come up, to give their name and their address. We also ask that comments stay to three minutes. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, good evening. Um, I would just like to say that the city needs to begin, begin meetings that are hybrid and hybrid, uh, being in person and Zoom, along with regular publication of verbatim transcripts. This is topical to the consent agenda because um, it, it impacts how the public can en engage with this agenda item. The fact that you all don't do this is extremely ableist and limits the ability of the public to fully engage with, this, with these proceedings. Um, so 
The plan is to be repeating this statement during every public comment time this evening, except the general public comment time. So uh, it, the county does this. It, there's no reason why the city can't do this. And so you, there are two options for tonight. Repeating the statement for every available public hearing where you have public comment, or the members of council who will be here in January can raise their hands and commit to having hybrid meetings and publishing transcripts. So if anybody on council who will still be here in January commits to doing this, please raise your hand now. To be clear, public comment period is not a time for votes to be taken. I mean, they can raise their hands if they want to. So it's topical and germane because it relates to how the public can engage with each agenda item. So, I mean, does anybody want to raise their hand to commit to this now? Or do you want me to repeat my statement again and again and again this evening? I, I guess I'll be back up here. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Or any uh, address council at this time on any topic that is not on the agenda item? That's on the consent agenda. That's yeah. not on the consent agenda? Consent. That, that is on the consent that agenda. That is on the consent agenda. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Welcome. All right. Um, I don't really feel the need to read my statement at this time, but I do second with what Dan just said about the raising the hands. And Eric, they can raise their hands all they want. Don't make up some weird bull crap about how they can't raise their hands. Will you please state good. your name and address? For, my name is Noah, and I don't dox myself. And I mean, yes, I understand you said you can put it on the next work session, but like you, Bruce, can call a special session for from I think two days from now. You could have one or seven or three days from now to say, and then y'all could just at that meeting say, okay, from now on we're going to be hybrid. It's that easy. <laughs> it's like I I'm I'm glad that you are telling me that you're going to be putting it on the work session for the next year, but this is something that should have been done quite a while ago. So I mean, I need to see some more urgency with this, frankly. And I'm going to be standing here for my time because at any time Bruce could make this into a special session because that's like that is the rules of your own council that you, the mayor, can do that. Anything else? And I, I just want like to make sure like remind y'all that this is not going to go away until it's accessible. Anything else? Yes. Are you going to do we, that? Bruce? We have a lot of people here that have items on the agenda. Anything yeah, else? And you, you, yeah. Anything like else? Like the balls in your court. At any time, you could tell me right now that you personally, as mayor, Thank you. will do that. No, my time's not up, so I'm not. I'm still talking. You can't move on from me. So as I was saying, no, uh, at any time. His comments are topical. As you know. Please speak to the council. Yes. I'm speaking to you because you are the mayor, and the rules state that you at any time, can, you can call a special meeting, work session, whatever, to do that. And then y'all can do that. Have, a, have your session for five minutes and say, yes, we're not going to stop being ableist and we're going to have hybrid meetings before the next meeting. Because that's still going to be, you're still going to be excluding people from that meeting too if you wait till next year, which is the problem with that. Which I'm glad you're now committing to doing that to the next year. But you, the urgency is this just like should have never like of, been like a problem to begin with. Like you should have never stopped offering hybrid once you started. It's really that simple. Thank you. Anyone else like to address a topic that is an item that is on the consent agenda? My name is Tara McGovern. Welcome. The fact that some of us may be familiar to you in discussions about accessibility is not because this is our concern alone. 
Many people can't come before you to make this request for many, many reasons. As a council, you should be welcoming this engagement. And if you're not, what does it say about you that you're making no effort to include a sizable portion of your constituents? I sat here at the November 30th meeting and watched as you spoke to my friend, who is neurodivergent, as am I, as if he were inconveniencing you by asking for basic accessibility on behalf of the larger community. This is after he wrote you letters, which you ignored. What we are asking for is urgency to correct a problem that is eminently correctable. Don't give us this bullshit about adding it to your pending work session topics. Get it done. Give us hybrid meetings, give us verbatim transcripts, or get ready for all of your meetings to get really long as we continue to stand before you and ask you to just do the goddamn right thing. Chapter 21 of Iowa Code states that the goal of law is to guarantee through open meetings of governmental bodies that the basis and rationale of government decisions, as well as those decisions themselves, are easily accessible to the public. The law also says that any ambiguity should be settled in favor of openness. Settle it. Give us hybrid meetings. Give us verbatim transcripts. This is a foregone conclusion. You will provide these accommodations because law and decency requires you. What's on your conscience is exactly how much longer you are going to willfully exclude your own constituents. Thank you. Anyone else like to address a topic that is on the consent agenda? Council discussion? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to um, address item 5K on the consent agenda, which is the um, settlement for the uh, national opioid. Uh, I believe Councillor Weiner would like to speak to this also. Um, prior to s the start of the COVID epidemic, the, we'd heard a lot in the news about the opioid crisis, but it was kind of overshadowed by the uh, constant news about COVID. Uh, unfortunately, the opioid crisis uh, is still an issue. And I, I was happy to see this settlement agreement, and I am absolutely in favor of the city opting in. Uh, I do think it would be beneficial uh, to partner with other uh, communities. You mentioned the joint entities meeting earlier, and I think uh, we could partner on the utilization of those funds that are being offered and would suggest that this item be included on the agenda for our next joint entities meeting so that we can talk about it with the other communities that are listed. So I wanted to um, refer to item 5K on the consent agenda as well, the National Opioid Settlement. Um, I don't think that we can overstate the importance of the opportunity that this presents, not just the city, but every county in, in the state. Um, the, it, opioid addiction is much more than, is something that affects much more than individuals. It impacts entire families uh, in all generations. It often turns grandparents into caregivers of grandchildren. So I actually urge everyone to look at this closely and all the different things that are part of this that, that can be done when the funds are available over a period of, of 18 years. Um, I also wanted to note that it's really, it's really exceptional that the, these funds in Iowa are being split 50-50 between the state and, and local entities. Um, there are a whole variety of things that go beyond what, one, what you might think. Um, would deal d directly with opioid addiction. It includes um, medication assisted treatment, naloxone to prevent, to reverse, to reverse overdoses, um, dealing with pregnant and postpartum women, um, treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome and working and, and potentially working on long-term monitoring of them. Um, as well as recovery, prevention, helping those who are incarcerated, um, looking at harm reduction, some things that are not currently not legal under Iowa law, but that can make such a difference and connect people with social workers and medical professionals that can, that can help start to um, turn their lives around and turn their families' lives around. 
unfortunately, I speak from personal experience on this, but this is a this is real this is a huge game changer that we need to pay very close attention to and coordinate to the greatest extent possible with other entities here. Any other discussion? Mayor, I just wanted to highlight um, item 5A, which is extending the time frame for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We discussed this at our last work session and just wanted to call out that there is a resolution in the consent agenda to extend the time frame for the commission for uh, an additional year, which would be until June of 2023. All right. You have no more comments. Roll call, please. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. We are on to item number eight, which is community comment. This is an opportunity for those in the community to talk about an item that is not on our agenda. And I will allow for three minutes um, per speaker. And we ask that you do write your name and your address on the side table. And give us your name and your address when you uh, come up. Welcome. Good evening, Council. Can you hear me? OK. Good evening, Council members. We're here to um, introduce ourselves. We are members of the Iowa City Airport Commission. My name is Electra Orozco, and I've been with the commission over a year. And my address is 3527 Middlebury Road. And good evening, Commission. My name is Scott Clare. I live on 7 Glendale Terrace in Iowa City. And I'm the current chairman of the Airport Commission. We want to take a few minutes to report with you uh, the updates uh, on the airport activities for the past year. A few things we want to talk about would be, first of all, the completion of the obstruction mitigation project, which is uh, intended to clear the obstructions that uh, impede the approaches to the airport. That project is now completed. We also completed some infrastructure and improvements over this past year. In total, we have invested about $850,000 of federal and state money on behalf of the city into the airport infrastructure and have received another $150,000 of COVID relief fund that's gone towards losses during the COVID period uh, on operations. Uh, the good news is the airport is functioning very well. We're break even or better on budget, so we don't uh, draw anything from the city. We're self-sufficient and our mission is to continue that going forward. Uh, and we've been seeing a lot of recovery uh, from the pandemic. In fact, this year, fiscal 21, we're seeing air, airport activity up anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, depending on how you count it from pre-COVID levels. So that's 2019 to 2021. So it is a, a very strong uh, asset for the community and one that we're seeing a good utilization of and a good return on our investments from both the federal state government and your continued support. Thank you. Thank you both. Would anyone else like to address an item that is not on the agenda? Of on the any item on a formal agenda. Welcome. Hello, my name is Roy Sam Porter, Johnson County Supervisor and President of the Black Voices Project. I heard some comments at the last meeting and I feel the need to come here tonight to correct the record. Laura Burgess pointed out that the TRC has tried to address the divide in the black community by holding a restorative justice circle that was offered to members of the Black Voices Project who have previously expressed opposition to the TRC. Susan Mims went even further suggesting that the members of the Black Voices Project and others who, volu who voluntarily resigned from the TRC are part of the reason there is a a lack of unity in Iowa City's black community. I do not believe we should be giving them the power to negatively influence the future of the TRC. And by not approving the facilitator, I believe that is exactly what we have done, she said. The elephant in the room is two white women acting as authorities on the black community and how we relate to TRC. Is the black community divided? Absolutely not. The black community is not divided as several of you suggested. You may hear different views expressed, 
but wouldn't you expect that in any group of people? Do all white people agree on everything all the time? Check yourself before you speak publicly to imply that all black people must agree at all times. The Black Voices Project amplifies and elevates black people in our community. We have consistently advocated for the experiences of black people in our community to be heard and inequities rectified. We do so by working together, not by tearing each other apart. This community is full of strong and capable black leaders. Mayor Bruce T, Mazahir Sela, me, Roy Sam Porter, Rakesha Harrington, Latasha DeLoach, Hamza Omar, Fred Newell, Nakisha Jones, Pastor Anthony Smith, and Andy Jordan, just to name a few. We know who they are. We do not need the city council to select them for us. Several members of lost my spot. Several members of this council have come to me for help behind the scenes while this TRC has been floundering. I gave you my time and my wisdom as a respected black leader in this community. You ignored it, did what you wanted, sat there, and let my character be assassinated in public, and now want to blame me, the Black Voices Project, for your failure. No, that's not how this works. Regardless of what this council or the TRC thinks or says about me, I am out here doing the work that you are not. People come to me with every type of need because they know I will help them. I will find the resources Thank and you. the people, anyone who wants to criticize Thank me you. for not being out there. Thank you. And for not being out Thank there you. screaming and yelling and telling on themselves because it means Thank they you. aren't standing with me doing the Supervisor work. Porter, Thank Serving you. hot meals to the homeless. Thank organizing you. clothing, food, shelter, and meals after the derecho. Arranging and organizing vaccine clinics and food box distributions at the Johnson County Fairgrounds. Connecting families with the resources to get help with their rent and mortgage payments and getting those phone calls from people in our neighborhood who have lost their loved ones to get help with funeral arrangements and to organize Juneteenth, just to name a few. So Thank let's you. be clear about who is actually doing the work to bring truth and reconciliation to Iowa City's black communities. Because it's not the majority of this council and it's not any of you people who have spent the last year trying to drag my name through the mud and pin their failure on me. Thank you, Mayor Bruce T. and Mazahir Sela for your wonderful service in our black community and for being a great leader in our community. Thank you. You're welcome. Would anyone else like to address any item that is not on the agenda? Welcome. I'm Steven Anderson, 1001 Oak Crest Street, Apartment 3. Um, I have an issue with the bus system. I ran this brought by the head of the Iowa City Transit on voicemail regarding the takeaway of the uh, bus stop at 10, uh, 1000 Oak Crest. They took that away when they reorganized the buses in August. Um, there's no sidewalk to the bus stop at 815 or 1100 Oak Crest to avoid going on the street. You either have to walk in the street or cross the street twice to get to a sidewalk to get to the stop on 815 Oak Crest. So that's a danger. So I would like to see the city council contact the Iowa City Transit and tell them to reinstall the bus stop at 1000 Oak Crest Street so people don't have to go in the street to get to the bus stop at 815. So somebody could break their hip crossing the street in the snow and ice or otherwise get hurt. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Cobble. Um, good evening. I'm here to talk about several other things aside from annoying you all about hybrid meetings. Uh, firstly, support the TRC. Uh, this council has kneecapped them. And you talk, folks talk on and on and on about division in the black community regarding the TRC. 
But um, I would like a lot of the people who talk about that to take personal responsibility for stoking those divisions. Roy Sand Porter was abusive and very, her behavior was very unacceptable as chair of the TRC. People I know and respect, people like Raneem Hamad, Amel Ali, they were on the receiving end of Roy Sand's abuse. And fun fact, if you had hybrid meetings, people like Amel could be here to talk about this. Because I'm on, Mel and I are messaging and talking about just all the things. If you all had hybrid meetings, Folks could come, more folks could come here and give an accurate gauge of what's going on in the community. You should not let the personal grievances of Porter and the Black Voices Project get in the way of allowing the TRC to help our community. If Roy Sam wants to talk about the TRC, let her talk about the way she treated Reneem. Let her talk about the way that she's treated Mo. Let her talk about the way that she's treated Amel. Um, anybody who attends the TRC meetings knows they are functioning. If you had high, and by the way, Roy San hasn't, uh, a f very few of you all have. Um, I, Roy San named people who are influential leaders in this community. I have respect for Roy San. I have respect for everybody on this council. I, I mean, I think, Maz, you've done such great work with wage theft. Roy San has done, Roy San is a force, but there's also things that should be called out with this. Um, Amel Ali, Eric Harris, Cliff Johnston, Daphne Daniels, Wangui Gutha, Mo, Mo Treori. These are just a few of the people who are working to help improve this community. We should not let personal grievances get in the way of the work because that's when nothing gets done. Um, I would also like to talk about changing subjects, the intersection of Dill Street and Rocky Shore Drive. It's a nightmare. The hill on Dill going down to the intersection is too steep and curvy to be safe. I challenge each member of the council to drive through that there on a snowy evening during the winter. Somebody is going to get killed on it because it's so unsafe. Councillor Thomas, traffic dad, my counselor. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what can be done about this, but something really needs to change because it's, it's really unsafe. Thank you all. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Noah. Um, so yeah, like uh, the person spoke just for Dan, he's talking about another accessibility problem you have with the bus stops and that problem as I've talked to you before about how benches and stops just gone missing across the city from different places for both the houseless people and people trying to just like use bus stops or to sit on a bench while waiting for their bus. Lots, mo lots of people throughout the city can't do that, which is an accessib another accessibility problem. Uh, the full verbatim transcripts of meetings are uh, still, uh, uh, last Saturday I sent you all an email and there weren't, but now after, I checked before this meeting today and there were more transcripts filled out thankfully, but still not for the last meeting, which is kind of silly. I mean, it's been like two weeks or so since the last, two weeks since the last meeting and there's still no full transcript for that, but the work session of that, and the work session of 12-7 there's a transcript for, but not for the last formal meeting, which is just bizarre if you ask me um, oh yes uh, shelter house uh, the director of shelter house made 130 130 uh, sorry one hundred thirty thousand dollars in the salary and benefits while currently there's not a winter shelter open when people are already experiencing frostbite and other problems from cold weather because shelter house is paying fourteen dollars an hour we all know that is an abysmally, that is not a living wage, and yet the director, Kristen Canelli, can make, can make 130K a year, yet they can't pay their workers a living wage and try to blame people not wanting to work on their low paying job. You, this city funds a lot of shelter house. I don't know exactly how much. I know you all spend a lot of money at shelter house, so. So, I mean, put some drinks on there. Say, don't abuse your workers by exploiting them, pay living wage. And then, since there isn't currently, open up the rec center or some other place immediately right now so there's actually a winter shelter for people. Because there is a tremendous lack of shelter in this city. Even if Shelter House still had it open, there'd still be problems because Shelter House doesn't treat people very well. Because like I say, lots of folks in the house community, they'll tell you we don't mess with shelter house because they treat us poorly, because they do treat them poorly. I've seen them kick people out for no reason, good reason whatsoever. 
your cops are kicking people out trying to hide them. Defund your cops and fund your people of the city. Your priorities are completely off. Developers can come here talk and say whatever they want. You get a response from you, but regular just citizens who want to, people in the community just want to like, have any say we have no say. And that's not all right. Just, just do some reflection and change that. Look into your hearts, as you like to say, Bruce. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address a topic that is not on the agenda? Welcome. Hello. My name is Kanisha Ensminger. I live at 902 North Dodge Street in Iowa City. Um, I'm here to read a email from a fellow organizer with the Mutual Aid Collective. Um, this is from Stephanie Riley. She writes, Council members, I would first like to go on record as saying I'm put out that you no longer make your meetings accessible to the public. I had wanted to be there in person to address this issue during public comment, but unfortunately my grandchildren, whom I provide childcare for, will not be picked up in time. Since you are unwilling to make hybrid meetings available, I will be posting this email on social media as well. On December 11th, one of the ICMA drivers was contacted by an unhoused individual who had been asked to leave Shelter House the night before and subsequently suffered from exposure to the cold. When our driver talked with him, he said he thought he had frostbite, but we don't have confirmation of that. When I asked what to tell individuals who don't have access to Shelter House's services on your social media, I was directed by whomever runs your Facebook to contact Shelter House, which obviously does no good in these situations. We understand that Shelter House usually runs the winter shelter, but it seems as though they are having problems pulling things together this year. I will say that perhaps if they paid people a living wage to work there, they would get more response. $14 an hour is a ridiculous wage in Iowa City, so it makes sense people aren't applying. Um, I am kind of veering off course here though. I am not interested in negating the work that Shelter House does, but the fact remains that some unhoused individuals are not welcome at Shelter House, and the city has an obligation to make sure that all people have some place to go rather than be exposed to the cold, even those who are difficult. So with all due respect, I would like an answer as to when there is going to be an emergency shelter open to all individuals in Iowa City. Is that known at all at this time? And this is just in the time for you to uh, address council with any of your concerns. Okay, um, do we know when an emergency shelter may be open? The winter shelter for Shelter House at all? Yep. Council don't engage. Okay. Um, like Noah mentioned, I also wanted to say myself, the fact that the executive director of Shelter House making 130,000 a year and wanting to pay people 14 an hour for help with Shelter House and not opening it because of that is abhorrent. And um, while it is warm, tomorrow we have record-breaking temperatures and possibly very dangerous winds, and I would hate to have unhoused individuals outside during that. And um, also to follow up on Supervisor Porter's comments, I just really needed to say that the black community in Iowa City is divided, as is every race ever, but there is a divide in the black community in Iowa City, definitely a generational divide, a political divide. She likes to give cops really nice toy cars, and not every black individual agrees with that. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address a topic that is not on the council agenda? Seeing no one, I'm going to close uh, the community comment. We are on to item number nine, planning and zoning matters. 9A, rezoning IWV Road Southwest. Ordinance conditionally rezoned approximately 53.36 acres from county agricultural to intensive commercial, approximately 17.03 acres from county agricultural to interim development commercial, and approximately nine acres from rural residential to intensive commercial for land located west of the intersection of IWV, 
Road Southwest and Slothauer Sloth Road. And this is the second consideration. Could I get a motion, please? Move. Second. Move by, C, uh, move by Salee, seconded by Weiner. And is there anyone from the public that would like to address this topic? <coughs> Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Dan Cobble. And um, I guess before I begin, uh, y'all don't even necessarily have to like raise your hands. I mean, you could stretch a little bit. <laughs> you could do whatever just to indicate that you're for basic accessibility for people with hybrid meetings and publishing transcripts uh, or not. So I guess I'll just begin. Um, the city needs to begin meetings that are hybrid in person and Zoom along with the regular publication of verbatim transcripts. This is topical because it, re it, it is related to how the public can engage with the agenda item. The fact that you all don't do this is extremely ableist and limits the ability of the public to fully engage with the, these proceedings. Um, and again, I will be repeating this every public comment time this evening. I'm sorry to the people in the public who have to sit through this because the council won't indicate whether they will meet basic accessibility needs. Um, but honestly, I don't feel bad about making council and city staff sit through this because I mean, I know you all have lives, but so the, you all talk about how I'm taking up your time and it's incredibly disrespectful to, to do something like this. And you all were very horrible to Noah last meeting when he tried to do this. I'm just gonna say, let's talk about the time that it takes the public to come to these meetings and talk to you all. I mean, having to, a lot of, for a lot of people, they can't come here because they can't engage with you. They can't engage in local civics because there are no hybrid options. And so, yeah, we're gonna take up your time. It's gonna be super inconvenient. Y'all are gonna be annoyed. And it, the reason why isn't because I'm a dick. I mean, I am a dick, but it's because you all aren't committing right now, raising your hands and saying, yeah, we'll, we'll work on this for hybrid meetings. So, I mean, if anybody wants to give me a sign, like, I mean, I just wanna go home and cuddle with my dog. But, um, yeah, so anyways, um, healthy governments are, I mean, the, the wild thing about this issue is that counselors have mentioned the reason why hybrid meetings aren't enacted is because you want to stem public comment. Well, <laughs> healthy governments are made healthier with public participation. I mean, the more people you get in here generating ideas, the more, I mean, that's healthy government 101. So um, unless you want me to continue doing this for the rest of the evening, y'all can just raise your hand right now and commit. Is nobody gonna do that? Jeff, are you gonna do that? Bruce, Pauline, Janice, John, Laura, I can have the city attorney look away. Um, no? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Um, again, this is going to be directed at you, Bruce, since you were the one in charge of meeting rules and policy and that stuff on public comment. So this is up to you, not the rest of council, really, at this point. Is at any time, you could call a special meeting to make your meetings accessible. Or tell me right now that you, Bruce Teague, mayor of Iowa City, will make the meeting accessible. I think it's been very clear that this council plans to do, to do that at the first meeting in January. We, we discussed this at the work session. So yes, on, be, on behalf of this council, they will be doing that in January. Why not now though? Because that's like excluding people till January. We, we, which is, it's, for is one, it? open meeting laws, we can't discuss stuff on our formal agenda. That's why we can't engage with the public. But you can call a special session to have a work session on doing that, to hold that in like, what, 30, start, sorry, 72 hours from now. You could have a meeting where y'all say, okay, we're voting for a hybrid meeting, here we go. You can do that. You personally, Bruce Steig, can call that meeting right now. It would take y'all like five minutes to do that. Y'all could even 
heck, call in Zoom since you can do that for yourselves when there's meetings. You never took away that option. You just took away the option for the public to get involved, which is the accessibility problem, once again, that's rife within the city. Yes, you have told me that, but like I haven't seen any urgency in it. That's the problem is that should have like this should have never like ever been an issue at all to begin with. That's like why it's a problem is because you took it away when you could take it right back like right now or say you're going to have their special your special meeting on it in a couple of days. You with your own council's rules, by the way. And you know that. I hope, being the mayor and all. If I know that, you should know that. Because waiting until January is, that means you're going to be inaccessible until January, and then people aren't going to be able to access the first meeting with the new council, which that, that doesn't do enough to solve the underlying accessibility problem that shouldn't even be a problem. When you, Bruce, right now, could say, could deal with, could deal, get away with all this so Dan and I don't have to keep up on doing this over and over again because you could call that meeting right now. Or get, heck, you could just get on your computer and email me that you're going to do that if you don't want to publicly say it. And then I'll, yeah. There are solutions to avoid this, by the way. But you, Bruce, I'm sorry, Mayor, is, is it said that that's the proper what you want to be called or whatever. But I do remember, like when Roseanne went on and on, you let her speak. Well, good, you're letting me speak now. Thank you. I have to make you. that point. Would anyone else like to address this item? Hello. Welcome. My name is Tara McGovern. Chapter 21 of the Iowa Code states that the goal of law is to guarantee, through open meetings of governmental bodies, that the basis and rationale of government decisions, as well as those decisions themselves, are easily accessible to the public. The law also says that any ambiguity should be settled in favor of openness. The problem that we're having is that we have been told that there, in the, the January, the pending work session, there will be some discussion of this issue. But the fact is that we've been talking about this and asking for this, and it's something that can be so easily accomplished. And you're leaving huge portions of the community out by not allowing for this. I mean, the last meeting, I, we know intimately well the last meeting went on for, I think it was something about five hours or something like this. And this is something that I'm aware of because since you all don't provide transcripts, this is something that we try to do for the people in our community on our own time, using our own time and money for the software. And when we feed those meetings into the, into the software, they're, you know, they're getting longer and longer every time that we have to stand in front of you and ask you for basic accessibility. Something that we learned from the pandemic is that these things that disabled folks have been asking for for years have actually been available to us for quite a long time. And it only, I think I mentioned perhaps to these same setting, that it only took um, rich people to be bored for long enough for these things to actually be available during the pandemic. So we know that we can provide these accommodations and you're just simply choosing not to do it. So, Telling us that it's on a pending work session is not sufficient to the needs of other people wanting to attend this meeting, to engage with this meeting, to tell you what's going on in the community. It's just not good enough. So we're asking you as a leader in one of the, what's supposed to be one of the more progressive cities in the United States, we're asking this city, Iowa City, in the state that uh, the state of Iowa, Tom Harkin wrote the American with Disabilities Act, we should be leaders in this way. How can you be resisting this? You should be thanking us for bringing this to your attention. And you should be acting on it. You're excluding people. And we're gonna have to keep telling you until you correct it. And it's a waste of your time, and it's a waste of our time. It's a waste of everybody's time. Just make the right decision. 
Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Council discussion? Roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 9B. This is rezoning east of South of Riverside Drive and north of McAllister Boulevard. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 5.81 acres of property located east of South of Riverside Drive and north of McAllister Boulevard from high density single family residential to high density single family residential with a planned development overlay. This is second consideration and applicant is requesting expedited action. I move that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived and the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Salee. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Yeah, I would like to Welcome. talk about, thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Cobble and I'm here to talk about accessibility concerns, which uh, hinder the ability of the public to engage with this agenda item. Um, I know people are probably annoyed that we're uh, doing this filibuster, but the thing is, this is number one, it's topical because every agenda item with these public hearings, People at home can't engage with these agenda items. They're limiting the ability of the public to talk about these agenda items. And I mean, the council is trying to go on, oh, we can't do this because of rules. So I'll tell you what, the mayor can it has, hammer his gavel, have a three minute recess, or even one minute recess, and everybody can go around talking about how they're gonna accept work off and do this off the record. They can say, hey, we will commit to having hybrid meetings. The mayor can ha do it right now, hammer his gavel, call recess. They can do this off the record. We can go back on track. Y'all can go about your evenings. The mayor won't do that because I honestly don't know why. It's no good reason, and I don't like to speculate about people's moral shortcomings. But um, it's, it's extremely ableist, and I mean, systemically, these meetings are structured in a way without the hybrid uh, meeting option. As members of the council and staff have said, it's to stem public comment. People from the public have a right to be able to comment on these things, and people can't. I mean, think about the inconvenience that we're doing to you all, and imagine trying to thrust that onto the public, because the public, I mean, instead of ha being able to sit at home comfortable in their bathrobe petting their dog, they have to come to these damn meetings. I mean, it sucks. That's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for increased accessibility. And so, I mean, yeah, people can be annoyed that we're doing this, or they can be annoyed at the fact that the mayor is not just having a quick little recess and committing to this. So, um, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's some kind of bullshit power play, and I don't understand it. So, I mean, instead of doing a quick little recess where everybody can, off the record, commit to this, totally legal, totally doable, I mean, it seems like I'm just gonna have to come up here all evening talking about this issue. And I, I mean, I wish I didn't have to do this. I wanna go home and watch The Last Duel because that movie looks really good. I love Adam Driver. But the, the city is wanting to stem public comment by not committing off the record right now in a recess to, to having hybrid meetings. Mayor Teague, you can end this. The ball is in your court. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, my name's Noah. Um, yeah, he said pretty much, as you know. Uh, at any time, as some of you have privately off record told me that you are, that for next, for next year it's going to be a thing. But that, it needs to happen now. And Bruce, 
mayor, whatever you want to be called, gavel, and all of you tell us off the record that that's what's going to happen, and then it's going to happen before the next meeting, and then you can set your special meeting, or you could do that now. It's really all, this is all on you, Mayor, not, not the rest of you. You, you. you could, you're all at his whims too in this matter, unfortunately. But it's really up to you, Bruce. Everyone have a lovely evening. And yes, this is a filibuster because right now the city is being ableist and I'm a disabled person and I don't appreciate my community being oppressed. And I'm not just gonna be okay with that. If my filibuster inconveniences you, I guess I'm sorry. Be mad at Bruce for not <laughs> to making meetings accessible then. Like, put, put your ang don't put your anger at someone who has no power and put on people who have the power to do this, to stop ableism right now. They are choosing not to. So I'm going to choose to use my time in this so-called democracy to try and get some change here. Your meeting could be a lot shorter if you would just do that, by the way. This isn't controversial. This is, well, it's not controversial. If it is controversial, you're morally wrong. It's that simple. If you like, you think it's controversial for having basic accessibility, but he's like, that's not a controversial thing, and shouldn't be at least. But again, that's the case with lots of the isms and stuff. Is that stuff shouldn't be controversy, but apparently is. Anything else for council? Um, eight, seven, six. Just waiting for the time to run down. You're welcome. Thank you. I do want to just mention that there are single moms and individuals that are waiting to talk on an agenda item. And what I what I will say is that this council has talked about having this item on our first first work session with our new council. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Please come and welcome. Hello, my name is Tara McGovern. I'm so glad that you mentioned single moms because, um, you know, Noah has spoken a little bit about what hybrid meanings might mean um, from the community that he is here representing. Um, and it's also a good idea for us to reflect on all of the other people that um, are left out by the lack of accommodations by the city. So there's something called curb cut effect. And what that refers to is the ways in which um, accommodations extended to people um, that that require them actually benefit all of us and so um, though there's lots of parents in Iowa City single mothers single fathers single parents of all varieties who might like to be here at this meeting and engage that are not able to do so um, so I'm, I'm, I really appreciate you bringing that up that idea because that's one of the groups that is misrepresented so um, I think perhaps just a little explanation of what exactly it is that we're asking for. Um, the Board of Supervisors and the TRC both have meetings um, that take place on Zoom where the public can call in and comment during public comment. This is technology that is available to you and is absolutely accessible um, that you're just choosing not to engage with. And so the other thing that we're asking for is verbatim transcripts. And that's something that might have been very complicated to provide in the past, but as it happens, there are lots of software like otter.ai is a software that can be used that would need minimal personal engagement in order to produce transcripts so that people who are, don't, people who take in information best when reading it 
have an, an opportunity to understand what's happening at these meetings in a way that might not be available if somebody's trying to watch the meeting or listen to the meeting. And so we're not asking for some newfangled technology that's not available. In fact, your very own ad hoc TRC is able to provide hybrid meetings because they made it a priority. And I was very honored to sit in the TRC meeting recently to listen to some young leaders come and speak to the TRC and be inspired by the work that they're doing. And the TRC managed to make accessible hybrid meetings from the beginning because it was something that they as a commission decided to do. It is something that you can do. It is something that could have been done for today. We all have other things that we want to be doing right now. And there are lots of people here who want to engage. We are just asking for accessibility for people who cannot engage in the same way that those of us who are able to be here today. So first it was Noah, then it was Noah and Dan, now it's Noah, Dan, and me. I mean, we're not the only people in the community that have issues with this. So I guess I foresee these meetings getting longer and longer until you provide this basic accommodation. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion. Mayor, I just want to clarify that we are voting on the rezoning of the uh, east of Riverside Drive and north of McAllister Boulevard. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Do, that's, do we vote on the yeah. condensing? Do we have to vote right. on that's, that? That's the motion that's on the floor now. It's condensing. It's condensing. Yes. Correct. Okay. okay. Which, which item now? Sorry. 9B. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I personally am not in favor of condensing. I, I think that this group had some issues that, uh, some questions uh, that still need to be uh, clarified before uh, the applicant can come back before a third reading. But that's my personal opinion. So there's, I mean, right now we have second consideration out there to, to, for it to be um, condensed or expedited. Is there anyone else um, in favor of what Councillor Teller is stating? If not, then I think we'll proceed with the expedited. Uh, roll call, please. Sully? Yes. Taylor? No. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion passes six to one. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So I'll move, Mims. Second. Moved by Mims, seconded by Weiner. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Motion passes seven to one, uh, seven to zero. Uh, motion to accept correspondence. So move. Second. Moved by Sully, seconded by Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number nine C is rezoning Hickory Trail. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoned in approximately 48.75 acres of property located south of North Scott Boulevard and west of North First Avenue from interim development, single family residential to low density single family residential with a planned development overlay. This is second consideration and the applicant has requested expedited action. I move that the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Taylor. And welcome, Danielle. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Danielle Sitzman, Neighborhood and Development Services. At the last uh, reading of this item, it was requested that the uh, applicant's uh, aerial flyover presentation, which was given to the Planning and Zoning Commission, be available for viewing tonight. Would you like me to play that? I would. I, I think I may have mentioned it, and I, I think it would be of interest to the Council and to okay. those watching the meeting. Have it here. We will dim the lights and cue it up.
Mayor, staff does not have a presentation tonight, but the applicant is here and would like to make a few comments. Great, thank you. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Andrew Alden from AG Architecture, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. That was a real solemn moment there as we did, did, did the fly around, but it was very quiet. I should have mentioned three key points about that fly around. So the purpose of the fly around was to show how the building design nestled in with the surrounding landscape. So the first point I would make is that the hills and valleys are accurate. It was based off of survey data that was applied. The size and form and mass of the building is accurate. The uh, location of the trees and the vegetation is accurate. But what we really used for trees was just for representation. So somebody that knows the real area really well probably said, there's a red maple right there. Yeah, there probably is. But if it showed trees in a site plan, we put trees in. If it showed vegetation, we put vegetation in. Once again, just to show the, the design of the building and how it nestled in that site. And I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Please come forth. And before we get started, could I see a, hand, a raising of hand of everyone that wants to address this topic? Please. It's only one or oh, two. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, oh, yes, Noah, as you know. Uh, ba, 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 ba. All right, I'm going to read the little resolution for Iowa City on calling special meetings here for you. Resolution 06 54, resolution repealing a resolution passed in July 2nd, 2002, establishing procedure for calling, establishing procedure for calling for a special meeting and adopting a new resolution, establishing procedure for calling of a special council meeting and notification of such electronically. Whereas city ordinance number 2342, codified as city code section 1 5 5, provides that the procedure for the calling of a special meeting shall be set by resolution. This is not the And whereas the city council expanded this item. It relates to this is, is about the accessibility of your meeting. This is the resolution that is that tells you how like, you could call a special session right it, now to end it, this. It needs to be on this topic, please. Uh, let's get to the good part. Uh, you, therefore, it shall be resolved by city council of Iowa City, Iowa, that one said resolution of July 2nd, 2002 is hereby repealed. Two special meeting of council, city council, city council of the that's a lot of cities of Iowa City, Iowa shall be called by the mayor or three council members. You're the mayor, so you could call that. Um, notice of the calling of a special council meeting shall be in writing and shall include the time and place of said meeting, the business shall to be conducted at said meeting, and the person, the person's calling said meeting, which if you requires you to gavel, gavel, and then call that meeting in your recess. If you can't do that this current meeting, but you can do that in your recess of the meeting to not make this meeting go on longer than it has to. Um, Yes, notice shall be served on each council member at least 24 hours prior to the time of said meeting by delivering a copy, therefore, to the council member in person or to the council. So uh, 24, not 72 hours, 24 hours, you could have a meeting about doing this. And then at that meeting, you say from now on out, we're going to have hybrid meetings immediately. That's something you can do right now and then figure out why you have a bizarre transcription schedule. So I haven't something I think I've heard back is you don't you're the old the past transcriber recently retired. So I don't know if it's a hiring problem or whatever exactly is going on, but you still have some transcripts and you have like more recent ones too, but so whatever's going on there is just weird. But you can immediately be doing the hybrid and then doing the full firm for me them. And yeah, as you know. I just thought I could read the, read the resolution so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> For you, Bruce. Thank you. You're welcome. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. My 
My name is Casey Court, and I live at 435 Rundell Street, and I'm representing the Board of uh, Friends of Hickory Hill Park tonight, and I wanted to reiterate that we do support this project very much, and we'd like to commend the developer for um, being community and environmentally minded um, with their decision on the development and um, on, on deciding to give the land to the citizens of Iowa City. I would also like to commend the uh, um, city councilors for um, choosing the right um, project for this special piece of land. Thank you. Thank you. And please sign in on the side table there. Thank you. Anyone else? Welcome. Hello, my name is Tara McGovern. Um, I'm speaking today about accessibility, which is relevant to this topic because people who wanted to come and engage with you about this may not have been able to do so due to your current policies that are in place that could be changed at any moment very, very easily. Now, the good news is I know Iowa City always really likes feeling better than other places, so I do have some good news for you in that regard, which is that the Coralville City Council. Now, here's the thing. In the Coralville City Council, you can't, when, even when they have Zoom meetings, you actually can't even co call into those Zoom meetings. You have to physically go to um, City Hall. <laughs> even when the rest of the council is meeting on Zoom, you have to physically go to City Hall in order to put in a comment for the City Council meeting. So you're already ahead of Coralville, which I think everybody can appreciate because we all like to think about what a progressive community we are here and how welcoming and accessible we like to be. So you're already ahead in that regard. You already have the great leaders of the ad hoc TRC who have already demonstrated in their own work prioritizing accessibility by setting their meetings up that way from the beginning. Um, and, and then um, you can look to the Johnson County um, Board of Supervisors because they also have hybrid meetings um, where you can call into Zoom and engage with the comments. Um, so these are all things that are really easily, easily able to provide. Um, and the reason that we're continuing to talk about it, even though um, I've heard you say that this is um, in the pending work sessions for the January meeting is, um, first of all, we all know that that's where topics go to die here we've been paying attention and also um, we're not going to wait until January because we shouldn't have to we're the public and we need to be able to be engaged with the city council you should care about our thoughts and our concerns and um, so I guess we're just going to have to continue doing this unless you just take a little break as a council be leaders frankly I don't know what's stopping you and just acknowledge that you've done wrong and you can do better this is not hard so, I mean, I'm happy to cede my last 40 seconds, 39 seconds, 38 seconds, if you just want to break and discuss, as a council, the leaders that we've elected and may or may not elect again, um, simply what we're asking for, which is accessibility. We want hybrid meetings and we want verbatim transcripts. And this is a city that's supposed to be a leader and there's no reason why you can't provide that. I think Jeff knows better than anyone how easy it would be to provide that. Perhaps you could speak to that. But I know the, it only goes in one direction. So, but fortunately, there's other people here in this room. There's people that are able to watch but not respond um, to the meeting. And so I look forward to you making the right decision. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, thank you, I feel welcomed. Uh, my name is Dan Cobble and I'm here to talk about accessibility. Um, so I am honestly shocked that like we're at this point where we're having to come here every public comment se session to, to talk about this issue. Because number one, folks have been talk requesting in-person Zoom meetings for months, months. There's been a lot of buildup to this moment right now. That's one reason why I'm shocked. I mean, there's no reason why the stone has been kicked this far down the road. Secondly, I'm shocked because it, I thought that we would get here, we'd probably do one hearing, maybe two hearing, 
Bruce, I thought you would call recess. Y'all would have the quick, yeah, we get this. We're going to go for this. We just, we're going to support it when it comes to the work session. Because, yeah, you have it on the work session. Again, work sessions are where things go to die. I'm going to have a little prediction for what will happen at that work session. Staff is going to talk to you about, oh, it's so hard to implement this. There are lots of challenges, blah, 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 blah. Lots of costs. Someone may bring up, hey, we don't want people coming, client, chi chiming in on all these issues because people have said that in the past. Um, or, I mean, that would be saying the quiet part out loud, so I don't know if anybody would do that. But, I mean, I'm, I'm just surprised that the city, like, I mean, you keep going on about how it's on a work session. That's not a commitment. I want, hey, I'm going to fight for hybrid meetings. And Bruce, yeah, I mean, y'all can talk about how we're wasting your time, we're wasting the public's time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're wasting single mothers' time. Bro, you're wasting single mothers' time by forcing single mothers to come here before this council where they could just stay at home with their kids and zoom in. I mean, what's that? That's ridiculous. And again, you, the power to not even, like... I'm, I mean, I, Noah said we could have this special session right now. I'm not even, for me personally, I'm just asking that, hey, you, you just all say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to fight for this. And we're, not that we're going to put it on a work session. Hey, we're going to fight for this, and we're going to make sure this is right. I mean, it's, it's just wild to me that nobody is doing that. I mean, it's kind of like a pissing contest. And, I mean, I'm... At the end of the day, we will win this pissing contest, but I mean, Mr. Mayor, you could just go into recess and have everybody commit that, hey, we'll fight for hybrid meetings, but you won't because you want to keep on this pissing contest. Well, I'll tell you what, I have a big bladder. I'm going to win. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Council discussion? And this is the rezoning of Hickory Trail. I guess I'm glad to see that the resident again, the resident and the developer come to agreement. This is really great. And that's kind of the model uh, I always appreciate it when I see the developer and the residents come together to agreement. So this is will be making like really easy for the council to decide. And again, thank you to the developer, thank you to the residents. We're coming together for this. This one is a big win for the community. And big win for the community, of course, yeah. Yes. I'll support it. I continue to think it's a, unfortunate that we've lost the possibility of 40 plus new homes in the area. Because that plan still did add land to Hickory Hill Park. I would just like to stress again to the developer that uh, with such a large footprint from the buildings that uh, you please take steps to minimize any overall impacts on the environment because um, there are many things that you can do and everyone will benefit from it in the long run. Roll call, please. All right. Just again, for clarification, we're at motion to waive second consideration. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So move, Mim. Second, Sally. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So, so move, Sally. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Sully. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10 is re-precincting. Re ordinance amending the section 1-9-3B of the Code of Ordinances of Iowa City, Iowa, establishing the boundaries of the voting precincts in Iowa City, and section 1-5-1, establishing the voting precincts that compromise the three city council districts in Iowa City. I'm going to open the public hearing and I'm going to welcome our city attorney Eric Goers. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item is going to require a little bit of explanation because of some late changes and the kind of rapid pace with which 
this process has evolved uh, given the late uh, federal census and late uh, state acceptance of um, the state maps that uh, put a lot of time pressure uh, on uh, the approval process. So again, uh, for those who uh, weren't at the council's last work session when uh, re-precincting was discussed, uh, staff reached out to uh, the county auditor's office and requested that they assist with the drawing of maps. We thought it would be nice to have an outside entity with kind of no dog in the fight to use uh, the county auditor's phrase. Um, draw the maps. Uh, they did so, and uh, uh, staff reviewed. Those maps uh, were A, B, and C. Um, the staff recommended C because it had a uh, just even uh, population for each of the 27 precincts uh, that uh, uh, brought to council. Council decided they wanted to have the work session, and so that's what happened on uh, December 7th. At that December 7th work session, uh, council expressed interest in maps A and C uh, specifically. Um, the developments since that time, that is since the work session on December 7th, include a number of things. One was further review of map A uh, discovered that it uh, had a precinct boundary that bisected uh, Briarwood Healthcare Center behind uh, old Roosevelt <laughs> School. Uh, obviously that's not good. And, and so we worked with the county to uh, make a correction on map A of that problem. That problem did not exist on map C because uh, both sides of Briar Hill were in the same precinct. Uh, the county has approved, uh, the county wasn't one who redrew uh, and the county has approved uh, that uh, change. Uh, that does result in a slight population. I think there were six people that moved from one council district, not precinct, but district to uh, the other council district. Uh, obviously that doesn't make a, uh, a significant difference in, in the population numbers. Um, furthermore, maps with the current versus proposed precinct lines uh, have been provided in the late handout and by the late handout, I better use dates because there have been a couple of late handouts. I'm talking about uh, the one from December 13th yesterday. Um, and so hopefully you folks have had an opportunity to do that. That was a special request from uh, council to be able to compare and contrast the proposed uh, precincts from what is present uh, now. Um, as I was suggesting, those uh, maps are now obsolete. <laughs> Sorry for that because of the most recent change, which happened today. And that's uh, that uh, the county uh, uh, approached uh, the city uh, yesterday and said they'd like to combine some precincts as they've done in the past. Uh, at some of the outlining areas uh, of the city so that uh, part of the county is uh, meeting in Iowa City with uh, those uh, precincts um, out there. Uh, I think it is three precincts uh, per map that is on each A and C. Uh, those new maps are provided in the late handout that went out today. Uh, Kelly has that loaded up um, on the laptop, so if council members would like to see uh, that maps, you have printed copies, but if you'd like to have them projected, uh, Kelly is indicated she'd be happy to uh, do that. We also uh, quickly changed the legal description to account for those because even though the county portions are obviously outside our city limits, um, it's been made clear that we need to combine them in the legal descriptions, and so the uh, late packet uh, also from today, I should say, from December 14th also includes amended uh, legal descriptions for the pre three precincts that are affected in each of those two plans. Those are, um, for what it's worth, in plan A, uh, precincts 10, 15, and 22. That is two to the south in the south district and one to the north. Uh, in plan C, those are in uh, precincts 10, 12, and 22. So those need to be incorporated into um, the ordinance uh, tonight. Now it was always uh, the plan um, following the council's work session on December 7th that um, we would have the public hearing and of course we would hear public comment uh, on uh, what they would like to see. Um, and then council would have the discussion and council would have to make a decision tonight about plan A, plan C, you know, something else, um, hopefully plan A or plan C because that's what we have prepared and we have a tight timeline. 
Um, and so when it comes time for that uh, motion, I will ask uh, council to advance uh, or, or move one of those plans, you know, A or C, what the council's choosing, and then uh, proceed to uh, council discussion and so forth um, on that plan. That doesn't mean you're wedded to that plan. You can, if it, it looks like uh, council is interested in the opposite plan, uh, the first motion can be withdrawn and the second offered, or we can do a motion to amend, kind of depending on how things go. Um, so you're not locked in, but I just kind of want to set the stage for what the uh, proceedings will be uh, this evening. Um, let me speak a little bit more about the, uh, the timing, just so um, that's more clear. Uh, the first uh, kind of drop dead date that we're up against is January 3rd. That's when, uh, that's 60 days past when the governor signed into law the state maps. And so we need to have everything uh, to the Secretary of State for their approval. Uh, no later than that. And more importantly now is that January 15th is the date at which all of these uh, are implemented in, into, or, or, or finalized, I guess I'll say. But before that date, we need to send um, our maps with their legal descriptions. If we enter into the agreement with the county to share these precincts and polling places, those agreements need to be uh, approved as well, and the county needs to finish all that. That all needs to be sent to the Secretary of State's office. They need to be given an opportunity to review the plans to make sure that no mistakes have been made. Mistakes were made 10 years ago, and so that's, that's, a, that's a live possibility. These legal descriptions, if you've had a chance to review them, are, are pretty complicated, and we've had very competent staff um, within uh, the city who specialize in this stuff, work them, review them, and so forth. Uh, and so it's our every expectation that everything will be correct, but I'm here to tell you that it, it would be easy to mess up one little thing. Um, and, and if there are any changes, they would need to come back to the city. The city would need to amend its ordinance with all that that entails all before January 15th. So we're in a rush um, as a result of, again, the state and the federal uh, censuses being rather late and uh, the approval of the maps being so late. And so that's the reason this has been, I mean, it would be, I would love to just defer to the next meeting and, and have it uh, more fully polished, but uh, that's why we can't uh, do that. So uh, again, um, you know, depending on uh, the way council discussion goes and so forth, um, I'll ask council to move one, have the discussion on one and so forth. And then the staff will also be asking for you to collapse all three readings into tonight so that we can get this sent off as quickly as possible um, to uh, the secretary of state in the event that there are any changes. Uh, as I've mentioned, there's a separate agreement that uh, we'll need to sign off with the county. Uh, we'll need to have that uh, approved. It, it's a staff's recommendation that we have a, a single item special meeting, perhaps as early as later this week, uh, to address and approve those, uh, well, that single agreement with the county. And then that could be submitted with our uh, material, well, needs to be submitted with our material and the county's material as well and uh, off to the Secretary of State's website, and hopefully we haven't made mistakes and, and we're done. Um, that's what I've got, uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about the process, uh, about the materials that are before you, um, or anything else about the, re, uh, or the precincts that have been proposed. So I, with respect to one of the things that you talked about earlier, the, the three county precincts or that, that would be um, voting is it is it simply that th those county precincts will be voting in one of the Iowa City precincts they always get different ballots and it's pretty seamless is that what this is focused on that's exactly right with with one potential clarification they will all be polling in the same place I'm assuming it'll be in Iowa City uh, just because we're more dense and we have more places available but uh, it, it will be in a single place and just as you say the different, uh, you know, city residents, county residents would get different ballots, and they do that all the time. That's they're fully capable of that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Could we get the current maps up on the screen just so that people who don't have them in front of them can sure can see? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. Uh, while Kelly's loading that, I'll uh, just describe a little bit more about what's on there. One of the things that um, Mark Kistler, who was kind enough at the very last minute to uh, put together these maps, uh, was to add a, a box which describes um, 
not only the precincts, the Iowa City precincts that are affected, that is, that are being combined, but also the number of people who live in uh, the, the townships and the unincorporated portion of the county um, to make it clear that those uh, total population of the precinct is is below 3,500. In fact, they all appear to be under 3,000, which would be similar to every other precinct in Iowa City. Uh, looks like Kelly's got them up. I'm sorry, I'm looking at a... Got a up. <laughs> all right, so Kelly's got A uh, up here. And so, again, just for the benefit of those who are looking at this first time. So when you look at the very kind of uh, southeast, the bottom right-hand corner, um, there's a blue line that is the, uh, represents the uh, boundary of uh, Iowa City. And so you see that there is uh, what appears on my screen anyway to be pink and tan. Those are uh, two areas that overlap. That is, they straddle both the county um, and the city. Those are two of the combined uh, precincts in question. The other is on the, oh, I'm sorry, one more, Kelly. Uh, the other is on the north side. Um, I'm sorry, Kelly's gonna take a moment to zoom in. All right, so you can uh, see those are the two precincts. Um, I'm having a hard time reading the numbers, but uh, for those, I think, is it 10 and 12? Or no, I'm sorry, 10 and 15 on this map? 10 and 15. 10 and 15, 15. thank you. Um, so those are the two on the south, and then there's one more on the north. Uh, Kelly, if I can get you to scroll up there. And that's, uh, I believe, 22. Um, so that's in blue in the center of your screen. So you see a reference to East Lucas North. That's an unincorporated portion of the county. And then south of that blue line is uh, within the city limits of Iowa City. Mm -hmm. So here's uh, A. Maybe we'll um, go to C. Kelly, if you're ready. Again, same idea, you know, southeast portion, you can see the overlap of the county into those two precincts. And again, same location in the north. Now in the north, it's in a, in a green, um, but also labeled East Lucas North. And, and so again, the, the idea is here is just uh, voter efficiency. Um, those folks are obviously used to coming into Iowa City for all manner of things anyway, and so they're certainly not, the county voters, that is, are, are certainly not inconvenienced and we're not overcrowding. The numbers I was referring to in a, mo a moment ago are to the left, um, kind of upper left of the screen uh, right there. It's awfully small. Kelly, would you mind zooming in on that just a little bit? Thank you. So those are the, you can see the total population listed for those following uh, combination with the county uh, portions of, of voters who would be coming in. As you can see, that's dominated by city residents. There's uh, a couple hundred, or in the case of East Lucas, Southeast, 14 people um, who will be uh, coming into, I well, I presume coming into Iowa City uh, to do their voting. Any other questions for Eric? Thank no, I'm just if I recall, I mean, I think what the what if I recall what the auditor staff said is it's essentially much easier for them to come into an Iowa City precinct than it would be to send them up to North Liberty, and that's why they're suggesting that. <coughs> All right. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, my name is Eleanor Levin. I'm a resident of the South District of 781 Sandusky Drive, and I simply want to uh, acknowledge and extend gratitude to the auditor's office staff, to the city staff, and to the city council for moving uh, with an expedited timetable on this incredibly important topic and making sure that our voting will go forward smoothly in 2022. See you the rest of my time. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? And Eleanor, if you don't mind, just signing on the table when you get a chance. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Noah. Um, are you going to call a special meeting to have, so then at, at the meeting you can establish or you can have five meetings for here and on out before the next formal meeting in January? All right, okay, let's do a little throwback here. I'm gonna read my statement I read last meeting. 
just to refresh y'all's memories. Um, now I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person out of meeting is not the same as giving public comment at a public meeting. That is a fact. It is unacceptable, ableist, and discriminatory that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not available for all public meetings. It is an accommodation that both the County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC are currently providing. We are in a pandemic. People currently still uh, people currently who cannot safely make it to a meeting are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. And if we weren't still in a pandemic, there are a lot of reasons people physically cannot attend meetings, like single mothers who have to take care of their children who can't physically make it to these meetings. They like to have higher meetings and zoom in. So it's kind of funny that you brought that up. Um, I guess we can't physically attend meetings, but still like to, and should still be able to if we truly had accessible meetings. I am a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to said meetings. But currently, I can't do that. This council is currently being uh, ableist and discriminatory against me and my entire in the entire disabled community. You are telling me and my disabled folks <laughs> community that we matter less to this government than our able neighbors do, which is wrong in this so-called progressive place, whatever that means. That term is meaningless now, but like this place is also surprised itself as being better than everywhere else or whatever. Even though it is better than most other places in, in Iowa, that's just the sad reality that we are here in Iowa in most places. And it's not acceptable to say look around and be happy with what, what you got when you're currently not being accessible. And you, Mayor, right now, could save time off your meetings by calling for a special meeting or gaveling and then calling for a special meeting. And then I won't have to keep doing this. It's really simple. So why aren't you going to do that? Thank you. So I'd like to know. Anyone else like to address this topic? Mayor, before the next public comment, I'm, I'm sorry, I failed to recognize that there are a couple of representatives from the county auditor's office who are here uh, at our request to answer any questions you may have, Mark Kissler and uh, Bogdana Valterin. Um, so if you do have any questions for the county from their perspective, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them for you. Great, thanks. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Karen Cubby. I live at 1425 Ridge Street in Iowa City. And I have to say, I haven't looked at these maps extensively, but what I want to encourage you is that a lot of change is going to happen in our community over the next 10 years. And so whichever map gives us the most flexibility for growth, not only on the outskirts, but growth in the center of town for increased density, to make sure there's room for all different kinds of growth, and that there's room for the worst case scenario of our state legislature doing things that make it harder to vote, that creates precincts that make it easier for people to participate. I hope that's the choice that you make. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Hi, um, I would like to address uh, accessibility concerns, which uh, limit the public's ability to engage with this agenda item. Um, I think first I'm just going to start and kind of tell a little story. Um, it, this person, I mean, is, is fictional, but also, I mean, I know that there are people out there and who have, are in a similar situation. Uh, her, let's just say her name is Loretta Buchanan, right? Loretta is 80 years old, bad knees, no car, no one to drive her. Winter time, she has to take the bus and to get groceries, to do whatever, to move around, to be able to do what people need to do to survive. Loretta Buchanan, because in the winter time, 
the city does a very poor, as public commenters have stated in the past, the city does a poor job plowing bus stops. And not only that, but the new bus schedule has her confused. So can't move around because there's no plowing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She wants to talk to the council about this, but can't because of accessibility concerns. Y'all are silencing people like Loretta Buchanan. I mean, there are, I mean, I, I know real people who I could name, but I'm not going to out them. But hybrid meetings are essential for getting the people in front of the government and having the government being held accountable by people. Um, it, it's just really a no-brainer. And, Mayor, you have the power to, whether it be a hearing to automatically, as Noah suggested, put this change into effect now, a special session, or just a short recess saying every, getting everybody to commit to this off the record, but just the gentleman's agreement, whatever you want to have. You have the power, Mr. Mayor. And it's really, it's, I mean, it's, there's been, a, there's been a lot of time of us speaking about this matter tonight, but I don't think that's the story. I think the story is the fact that for whatever reason, you're putting your pride ahead of the welfare of the people attending this meeting who have to sit through all of our bullshit because you're refusing to just commit to this. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really embarrassing for you, Mr. Mayor. And to be honest, I think that when time comes, when the new council is in session, fellow councilors, I don't even know if you all would want to have the mayor, appoint the mayor to be the mayor again. Because, I mean, there's so many other issues. There have been problems with the mayor's performance with this and with lots of other stuff. So, I mean, maybe we need a new mayor. I want to be opposed. I'm curious to see people's thoughts about this. So, thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, my name is Tara McGovern. Um, this will be my last comment. I have to go pick up my child. Um, and I wanted to talk about accessibility. I'm mentioning that because I, I would be here longer if I could. Um, I don't know why you haven't had a short recess and discussed doing this very basic thing that we're asking. Um, but I, um, I guess this would just be a good time for us to reflect on where we see ourselves going as a city. Um, so a, a lot of... Um, there's a lot of people in this community that don't feel like they have a voice in government. And there's actually quite a few people who are, are um, organizing so that we can have more accessibility in government. And when we bring accessibility concerns to you, when we've brought them to the Board of Supervisors, frequently what we get are people talking about how they're experts on disability because they work with people with disabilities. And um, this is a really problematic fallacy that we've heard um, from various people in government who may have um, experience working with people with disabilities, with, with disabled folks. Um, so what we're asking for here is to have our actual voice. We want you to allow disabled folks, to allow people that can't attend these meetings for other reasons, to have an actual voice and not to speak on our behalf. It's not enough to say that you've worked with people, that you have an idea of what their needs are. We're standing in front of you and telling you, we want to engage with government. And we vote. <laughs> you should want us to be engaged. We communicate with each other. We organize. Um, and a lot of us actually do quite a lot of work that the city just doesn't bother to do. You know, there's a lot of people um, in our group that are serving meals to folks that need them, that are otherwise filling in gaps, um, helping with snow shoveling rather than getting penalized um, by the city. There's just people, neighbors, friends, people gathering in our community that are organized, and we just don't feel like we should have to fight with you to be, um, to hear among you, to be able to comment, and, and to have you hear us, and to have you take action and not tell us bullshit things like, we're going to talk about it in a few weeks. This is so easy to fix. And I really think every one of you should be very embarrassed at this moment that you are not looking into your own basic humanity and just taking a pause and thinking, we are excluding people. We are willingly excluding people. 
and there's something that you can do about it and you're just choosing not to. It's bullshit. Do better. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion. Yeah, we need, so we if you're ready, you can close the public hearing and then oh, we could, yeah. okay, that is right. All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. And, all right, council, could I get a motion to give first consideration, and, and I think we're gonna do it for map A and the legal description associated with map A. So move. Second. Move by Salise, seconded by Weiner. And council discussion. Based on the work session conversation that we had and the presentation from the auditors um, representatives, I think map A is is the one we should go with, um, particularly relating to the ability for areas to have growth in the future. Um, I appreciated the idea behind C being like balanced at this moment in time, but I think it would be good for us to be proactive and um, have those precincts that can expand. Yeah, and I agree too with Council Burgers about that, and I like it because especially it's not dividing the University of Iowa into two different breathing, so no confusion. And uh, the growth also, big deal. And yeah, I I'm gonna vote for A. Uh, I support A as well. Um, I, I was uh, particularly concerned with those persons who um, choose to vote at their polling place um, have no barriers to that polling place. For example, and this was highlighted by some you know, resident in the South District that you know, the current precinct, uh, residential precinct crossed over Highway 6. I think of Highway 6 as one of the most significant mm -hmm. barriers, physical barriers in Iowa City. And so with the creation of the new, the new precinct south of the um, highway, distinct from the area to the north, I think that was a significant improvement. You know, I've also, I'm very much interested in another aspect of this, and I did contact Mar Marsha Bollinger on this question, and that is the degree to which the precincts either align or do not align with how neighborhoods kind of self-identify geographically. Um, it's helpful when they do, I mean, it's not essential, but I, I do think when, when all, all maps of a given area um, reflect one another to a great extent, uh, there's a benefit to that. You know, I'm, I live in the north side. The north side has an identity that's based in part on its geographical form and shape. It actually has been impacted to some degree by Plan A. It's you know been chopped off and fragmented on its southern southern boundary, but um, that fragmentation I don't think will be will disable the this identity that the North Side has. There are other other aspects that contribute to that identity, and it also speaks to in my mind to the other piece of this which we don't really have current information regarding, and that is where are the polling places, because the polling place locations will, all, sorry, uh, will also um, be a factor in terms of the two issues that I'm raising. One is access, and the other is, does this polling place, um, as in the north side, and I, I don't mean to emphasize the north side, I just happen to know it better, uh, Horace Mann is the center of the north side, so the fact that it's a polling place reinforces that sense of its centeredness, um, you know, public, a public facility in the center of that particular neighborhood. Um, I wish going into this that, um, you know, in asking Marsh about this, she did speak to some people about it, um, but it was not something that generated widespread uh, discussion. Um, in any event, you know, it seemed to me with regard to that issue, Plan A was was effective in ad addressing some of the deficiencies of the existing precinct map. In terms of growth, I mean, I think you know there's room within all the precincts to grow. I think predicting growth is very difficult in some respects. So I'm 
you know, I, I'm more focused on how, how are these precincts serving the existing community, uh, and that's been my emphasis. I sort of looked at, um, I, I also favor Plan A for a couple of the reasons that have been discussed already. One is really the, the, the possibility for growth on the fringes that's built into it, where, where we know that there are growth areas for the city. Um, another is that it splits the, the dorms evenly so that you have the east side and the west side side dorms. And that, to me, it, it's often a challenge to, to get our, the student population to vote. Um, we want to make that as easy as possible and as, um, and as sort of logical as possible. Uh, and when I sort of when I look at some of the actions the legislature took over the last over the in the last session, um, and think to myself, what could what might they do to further to make it even more the process more difficult than they have in the past? The thing that occurs to me is they could decide to get rid of satellite voting. We have often used satellite voting in particular to help get the students to vote. So the, the fact that Plan A, that, that A makes it as simple as possible for them to figure out where they're going to vote is makes a difference to me. I also support Plan A. I, I felt that it, it had uh, cleaner, more clear border lines uh, of the precincts with uh, less disruption of, of the current lines that we have and not crossing over the river or uh, the highways. Um, also, as uh, others have mentioned, the uh, growth potential, particularly uh, on the east side and the uh, south side, where we know we're going to have um, uh, growth there. Um, and also, as um, Councillor Weiner had mentioned, the uh, splitting up of the uh, east side dorms. It's, it's, um, they have a common border, and in this, in Plan A, it, they share the same common border. So I approve of A. Could I add one more brief thing? I just really would like to thank the auditor's office for all the work they've done on this. Mm -hmm. For, and I, and I would echo that, um, appreciation for the auditor as well as for the staff and their work on this. As we know um, from our work session that we had about plan A, B, and C, we learned that um, in our discussions that there were some positives about each of them. Um, and even, you know, C, looking at some of the revisions, although um, it, they weren't that substantial, um, there are good things about C that I certainly can support, but I think for all the things that I've already mentioned that I won't go back into, I'm going to support A. Yeah, I would just say looking at A um, for the growth purposes, I think keeping all the east side dorms in one district, uh, those are probably the two most compelling things for me. Okay, so sound like we have uh, we're ready to get roll call. What? Weiner? I, I'm sorry. Do we need to do the condensing before we? Yes. Fair question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> procedurally, I should kind of lay out what we're hoping to do. Okay. Uh, because we're hoping to collapse all three readings into one meeting, uh, what we're hoping to do is have a motion to have first consideration, and I'm sorry, that's the one that's already on the table, mm -hmm. and then uh, a motion to waive a second uh, consideration. Third. Well, okay. yeah, and then we'd have the motion to accept the third, um, I'm sorry, to pass and adopt as a third vote. Um, okay. Yeah, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. So, so this yeah. is first consideration. Uh, on the table right now is just a motion for first consideration. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salih? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Staff now. has a uh, request to expedited action. Okay. So I'm just, all I'm doing is expediting the second vote, is that correct, using the same language we typically have yes, used? Yes, same language, okay. yes. I move the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived and the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. So, moved by Mims, seconded by Taylor. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salih? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? 
Yes. Weiner. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved, Mims. Second, Sally. Roll call, please. Mims. Yes. Sally. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? Move. Second. Moved by Sally, seconded by Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item I mean, number 11 is the proposed. I'm sorry, self- Mr. Mayor, may I interject? Just while we're on this topic and so forth, as I mentioned, we will have to uh, approve the uh, agreement with the county so we can include that with the submission to the Secretary of State's website, or I'm sorry, the Secretary of State's office. And so we are looking for a, a single item uh, special meeting to be called again as early as the end of this week, if, if that's uh, available. And so, I, you know, we can either schedule that now if everyone's here or we can have Kelly uh, get a hold of you all quickly um, on an individual basis is whatever you want to do. I think we can do it now. Well, just get the date now. Yeah, yeah we're just we're talking about the date. The date. Now, yeah, I mean, yeah. We can get the date now instead of Kelly like reaching out to us. We're over here. Okay, that's my question. Yeah. And if we can do it this week or I don't know, next week it will be tough for me. Mm-hmm. Can we do it Friday? I could do Friday, but I have a Jack meeting at eight o'clock. Yeah, we have Jack. We have Jack at at eight, which will probably last at the, like an hour or so. Yeah. Nine. And, it, and it's actually out at Jack this time. Yeah. So. Uh, I would say not before ten, just to make sure we have enough time for that meeting and to get back here. Okay, 10 work for me too on Friday, if work for us. Friday, Friday the 17th. At yes. 10 a.m.? Okay, we'll take care of it if, if that's... Okay, great, thank you. Okay. And... Just gonna do that really quickly. Great. All right, we are on to item number 11, which is the proposed South District Self-Supported Municipal Improvement District. This is an ordinance amending Title III, Finance, Taxation, and Fees of the City Code to add a new chapter to establish the South District Self-Supported Municipal Improvement District, pursuit to the provision of Chapter 386, Code of Iowa, and providing for the establishment of an operation fund and the levy of an annual tax in connection therewith. And I'm gonna open the public hearing and I'm gonna welcome Wendy Ford, city staff. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and, and council. I'm Wendy Ford, economic development coordinator, and I'm here to talk about the proposed SMID. In October, the city received a, a petition from property owners in the South District to establish a self-supported municipal improvement district, also known as, and to what I will f- refer to from now on as a SMID. The petition met the required thresholds with signatures of 25% of property owners and property owners representing at least 25% of the property value in the proposed area, which you can see on the slide to your right, to my right. Council then set the, sent the petition to the Planning and Zoning Commission for review at their meeting on November 4th. P&Z reviewed and then forwarded, forwarded a recommendation for approval back to Council. A public hearing is required before adoption of the ordinance establishing the SMID. So today is the public hearing and the first reading of that ordinance to establish a SMID. The boundaries as shown on the slide are um, essentially um, encompassing the Pepperwood Plaza neighborhood. That um, diagonal across the top is Highway 6. The large area is uh, in the middle is Pepperwood Plaza. And then on either side of uh, Keokuk Street on the west or left, and down along Broadway Street to Cross Park Avenue um, is generally the, the neighborhood that is um, Pepperwood Plaza and would be, those would be the boundaries for the SMID. The uh, SMID levy rate would be $5 per $1,000 of valuable of taxable valuation, and that would generate approximately $104,000 per year. 
the duration of the SMID would be five years, and then it would sunset or it would be renewed based on the will of the property owners there and how they felt the success of the SMID was. Um, for some folks who may not know what a SMID is, it is a self-imposed uh, tax, additional tax on properties within a district. And we have already had the experience of the downtown, the Iowa City downtown district having established a SMID years ago and uh, carried those activities forth to um, uh, the downtown area. So funds from this additional tax would be used for administrative and operational expenses in the district as defined by the state law. A board would be established to hire a director and then direct work, the work of the, the plan of work, which has been drafted but would be approved after the board is established. The draft plan of work includes development and management of activities in support of marketing, business retention and attraction, also, physical or other improvements designed to enhance the image and appearance of the, approach, of the proposed district, including, but not limited to, lighting improvements, seasonal decorative enhancements, signage, wayfinding, banners, landscaping, et cetera. And then finally, to also hire an executive director, and if needed, uh, and additional staff support who could uh, support this nonprofit board of directors to manage the work of the SMID. It's important to note that this, uh, this uh, would align with the uh, comp plan as it notes the importance of thriving retail centers for sustaining residential neighborhoods and employment centers. And we know that's a growing area. Also, the South District Plan states a goal to encourage and support residents, neighborhood organizations, and business and property owners to advocate for the uh, continued improvement of the South Side neighborhoods in keeping with the goals of the comprehensive plan. And that neighborhood has certainly done that. In fact, have spearheaded this um, establishment of this uh, district. Um, and other couple things of note is that this area also falls into the Highway 6 urban renewal area, which actually sunsets in 2025, and who has goals that are complementary to the uh, SMID goals as well. And lastly, it also falls into the new, newly established Highway Commercial Urban Revitalization Area that offers a, um, a tax abatement on improvements made to properties within certain districts as well. So that could complement, in fact, the activities of the, of the SMID there. So those were my comments. If you had any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Erin Nunn, thank you so much. No, I just have one. Would you like me to leave the slide up for a little bit? There's yeah. One. Wendy, I have a question. Okay. Is this the model like for the South District, and we know that there is one in the downtown. Is this the only two models in the city for the whole? The only two in Iowa City. There are other examples across the state, though. Okay. Yeah, okay. No, I'm just meaning like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is great, yeah, okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to acknowledge that Councillor Burgess is recruiting herself from this item. Mm -hmm. If anyone from the public would like to address this topic, please come forth. And there is a sign up sheet on the side table and we ask that people give their name and address. Thank you. Uh, my name is Angie Jordan and I live on Apple Court 1125 in the South District. Um, I'm also the president of our Neighborhood Association, chair of our Business Revitalization Committee, and currently a tri-chair of the Project Better Together 2030 Steering Committee. I believe it is important for city leadership and others to know that business revitalization, like all of our initiatives in the South District, is a vital piece to our larger grassroots neighborhood revitalization effort. We dream big and boldly and work collaboratively with those who understand that when one rises, we all rise. Three years ago, we engaged our commercial district and many, many nonprofits responded, but we had very few businesses interested or maybe unable to connect with us at that time. 
Once we organized and found a possible tool, a SMID, that has had success elsewhere, we re-engaged and learned so much about the current and past struggles these businesses and property owners have faced. You may hear some of them today, tonight. You may have already heard some of them through emails and phone calls. It's overwhelming, and it shows just why it's important to create a SMID to actually tackle these shared challenges in a meaningful, sustainable way. I also want to share that our current neighborhood association is proof of the power of collaborative efforts. Three years ago, four small neighborhood associations shared many of the same challenges and saw strength in pooling resources, engaging each other, and doing the work together as a unified entity, the South District Neighborhood Association. We have successfully proven the significant impact that is possible through our time and engagement in public art, uh, bicycle culture, gardening, crime and punishment, voter engagement, access to literature, school connections, beautification, resident connections, craft circles. We have pieces and parts that when we put them together, it starts to create the neighborhood we want and believe can exist. Having a strong business district is a huge piece to this puzzle that is currently missing though. Having a unified business district has so many benefits, and I'm super excited uh, for some folks to speak more on that, how maybe those benefits would affect them. Thank you for your consideration of this petition that has potential for bringing many more of those puzzle pieces together to creating the lasting change we seek, we all seek, in Iowa City. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. And then I will ask people to, um, if you want to address this topic, you can come on up and start signing in. Welcome. Good evening. Kate Moreland, 2028 Lawrence Court, Iowa City. Uh, I'm also president of the Iowa City Area Development Group, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the South District SMID. As we are navigating this period of economic recovery, it's critical that we do so in an inclusive way. And the SMID is an economic development tool that will serve as a key investment in this area of our community. I commend Andy Jordan, Tasha Lard, and others that have committed years to this effort. I believe we're going to look back on this time as a very pivotal and key moment when we made an investment that will be transformational for this part of our community. ICAD looks forward to continuing to support economic development in the South District. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Nick Pfeiffer. I actually live in Tiffin, Iowa, but I'm representing Think Iowa City, the Iowa City Coralville Area Convention Visitors Bureau. Uh, I would, I'm here tonight to express on behalf of Think Iowa City the support for the South District SMID. Angie Jordan and her team, has, as you have already seen, have, have a fantastic plan already in place uh, to improve the quality of life in the South District and make it a destination throughout for others throughout Johnson County and beyond. We've seen what a SMID can do in the development of the Iowa City Downtown District. Our downtown is the envy of similar cities throughout the nation. I have no doubts that the SMID can bring great success to the South District neighborhood and the businesses within. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kim Casco, President and CEO of the Iowa City Area Business Partnership, your local Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of the Business Partnership, I'm here to voice our support of the creation of a SMID in the South District of Iowa City. SMIDs are a great economic development tool and a great model for providing localized business support. We have a great partnership with the Iowa City Downtown District. They provide that uber local support to, within their district to their businesses, and, and we help connect them across the whole county and so we really look forward to building that same partnership with the South District SMID. Having a SMID in the South District of Iowa City will be beneficial not only to the businesses in that district but to the residents in that neighborhood as well as well to, to the whole Iowa City area and surrounding communities. It will spur economic development, extend infrastructure, enhance livability uh, and enrich community building. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tasha Lard. I'm the owner of JD Beauty Supply inside of Pepperwood Plaza. And the importance of having a SMID in the South District is so that the businesses in the area can continue to grow and flourish the way that they have been. I support the SMID 100% as being a business owner in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Marlene Mendoza. I am, uh, live in North Liberty, but I'm here representing League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, in Council 308 in Iowa City. Um, I'm here in my support and representing LULAC for the SMIT proposal. Um, I do want to say that this is completely a community-led effort. For those of you who might not know the history of how this came about, um, we've been working together, Tasha, Angie, and everyone here who's pretty much talking uh, to get the ball rolling on this idea uh, pre-COVID. Um, so this just comes to show you how when we're put under a very stressful situation, what the community members and those that want to see business revitalization will do to come together to achieve that goal. Um, and to show you that there's energy already existing and that this is just the beginning of something that could really extrapolate to something even better is that last summer we didn't want to wait until we could have some of these hearings to pass the SMIT to get started. Uh, one of our intentional ideas was to continue to support the small businesses and entrepreneurs in that area. And we did what some of you might have uh, heard last summer. I mean, this summer was the diversity market, which was a pilot program that we started. We had over 30 vendors, many of the same people who live in the same area that is one of the most highly densely, densely populated and very diverse areas in the in Iowa City city, to come out to show people that there's other areas where we can host uh, markets, where they can come and see the people that live there, um, and get to engage in a community in an area that, let's be honest, uh, does not get much foot traction in that area. If you go to Pepperwood Plaza, it's very hard to even see signage or any, any direction to tell you that you can actually go in there. Uh, it is very underutilized, and we're just very excited to see what we can do in our own community to see it grow. Um, and I'm just very excited to see uh, what happens with this. And uh, thank you all for your support and time. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Liz Little. I live at 4916 East Court Street. Um, thank you for your time and your review today of the South District SMID proposal. Um, I am here also to represent Midwest One Bank. Um, we've had a longstanding commitment to serving the neighborhood and are in full support of this proposal. Um, I manage the branch over at Keokuk Street um, of Midwest One, and I can see on a daily basis how this SMID would impact the neighborhood in a positive way. Um, there are several things that excite me about the SMID. First is the ability to increase foot traffic to the area. Second would be to attract and bring in new businesses to the neighborhood. And lastly, the ability to collaborate with one another and create a unified voice. For years, we've been working independent of one another, and the SMID provides a platform for the neighborhood to come together as one. If I've learned anything over the last couple of years, it's that we're stronger together. We're asking for your support of this proposal. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Eleanor Levin. I am a South District resident at 781 Sandusky. And, uh, I want to thank you, city councilors, city staff, and members of the public for your attention to this incredible opportunity. I relish the sights around the residential streets of my neighborhood. The parks, the people on bikes, the gardeners, the basketball games. The businesses, on the other hand, the outward facing piece of the neighborhood are unremarkable, as has been mentioned, underutilized and disconnected. The South District of Iowa City SMID proposal will bring the commercial properties to life. Every property owner who signs on is looking forward to improved signage and lighting, coordinated marketing, walkable events, and improved utilization of the neglected properties with a powerful potential clientele living all around. The businesses currently in the area work incredibly hard, and I see the SMID supporting them and helping the area to thrive long into the future, even as it creates opportunities for new and exciting retail in and around Prepperwood Plaza. Please. Throw your support behind the South District Self-Supported Municipal Improvement District. Let's see what happens when a small portion of the business resources are pooled and put into use by folks who love this place and want to see it bloom. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name's Katie Gerlach, and I'm a resident of Iowa City, and I've been a longtime volunteer with the SMID organizing group. I think you can see from everyone that's speaking tonight, it's a really broad and diverse group of supporters. We've got businesses, we have economic development agencies, community members, re uh, residents, business owners, and you can see from Tasha, Marlene, and Angie's passion that we have what it takes to be a successful SMID organization when, when this passes and becomes an organization. 
Uh, I just hope that you'll support it tonight and improve the wayfinding retail recruitment opportunities and the special projects that await us for the South District. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Ellie Hoffmeyer and I'm at 227 East Washington Street. Um, and I'm speaking as a fan of the restaurants uh, around the Pepperwood Plaza. Uh, I've, I've been in uh, Iowa City for five years and I just discovered some of them uh, in the past two years and it bums me out that I didn't know they were there the whole time I've been here. Um, so I hope that the aesthetical improvements and signage will help more people discover uh, all the great stuff that's in uh, the Pepperwood Plaza area. So, Thank you. Welcome. Hi, uh, Mohammed Traore, Chair of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. However, just speaking for myself. Um, so currently living at 1002 Hillside Drive in Tiffin, Iowa. Before that, resident of the South District on Burns Avenue for 19 years. Uh, my time in the South District watched as many businesses came and went. Uh, my first job actually was at the Kmart that used to be in the South District. I uh, worked there from the time that I was 16 to the time that I started college at the University of Iowa. Uh, at the time, it was pretty much the only place to get groceries in the area. And then after that, they had Lucky's Market for a little bit, which is now also gone. Kmart's gone. And when you look around, you really see Casey's General Store. And the Quick Star is now open, but that's the closest thing you get. Otherwise, you have to go over to the hy V, which is in Riverfront Crossings. Um, the lack of accessibility to one food, um, the lack of businesses, the lack of tech infrastructure, the lack of telecommunications infrastructure in general, such as how bad the cell service and things like that are in the area or things that just desperately need to be addressed. Um, next, when it comes to aspects of actually getting around um, Pepperwood Plaza, as, as has been said, uh, the lighting can be improved, the signage can be improved. Most importantly, I see it as an area that could really be a focal point for major growth. Um, the diversity market in itself volunteered at three out of the four events, and I saw so many business owners that have major potential and can not only start their own restaurants, but potentially even have multiple of them, not only in Iowa City, but in Coralville, North Liberty, elsewhere. The economic boon that this SMID could bring to this area is much greater than the investment that it'll take to get started, in my, my honest opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Nancy Bird. I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa City Downtown District, and we're um, a huge supporter of the South District SMID. Um, as you may know, SMIDs are areas where um, they're born of the Iowa SMID law, and they typically occur in areas that need additional enhancements above and beyond city services. So while the city can lay out a plan, sometimes um, land use changes and organization around those plans need additional support. And while downtown Iowa City and the SMID that helps generate the revenue for the, our nonprofit organization is very different from the South District area, the same tool can be used to help support a really sustainable revenue support source so that the nonprofit organization that will be formed can start conducting and guiding that private investment into this area and be a really good unified voice um, with the city of Iowa City. And as you all know, when there's lots of voices, it's hard for staff to kind of tailor in what should move forward. And with a unified voice in a certain area, it'll help city staff work towards really great opportunities that are really democratic to the needs of that particular neighborhood. So we're very pleased to support this plan. Uh, we've been a technical support and we see a great collaboration between the two neighborhoods moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Noah. Um, so you literally like just called a special meeting. The item before this, you called one. So you know how to do it. Why won't you do one for the making accessibility? That is just as urgent as redistricting that. It's just because there's a legislative deadline for accessibility doesn't change the urgentness of having accessible accessibility. That <laughs> it just kind of makes me laugh at this point. <laughs> it's not not that it's funny that y'all being that you're being ableist, but like that you just. But I've been calling for this entire meeting is to make a special meeting. You did that. 
You've shown how easy it is to do that. You could do that right now. Are you going to do that right now? Because you, you show how easy it is and how you can do that. And it's well within your ability to do that. You're making the choice not to. Because waiting until January to have means accessible means that at minimum, the first meeting in January is not going to be accessible. That's not okay when you can have special meetings like you literally just called to address that so you could have your first meeting in January be accessible by having a hybrid and full verbatim transcripts uh, published promptly and easy to find the website because it's still difficult to find the website. You have to go digging through it where it should be, where all the information, contact information, information about where this meeting is, when, when you make it hybrid, where, how you can zoom in or call in, whatever option. You, I'm assuming you're going to do the Zoom because that's what the uh, other two in the county do is Zoom. So you can do it. You, sh you showed like how you could be doing that in the item right before this. There's no good reason not to, besides your pride, Bruce. You should swallow that and say, right now, we're going to have a social meeting to make our meetings accessible before the new year. Accessibility should not, we should not have to wait for accessibility. It should have never gone away to begin with, and there should always have been the full verbatim transcripts uh, gone promptly. I don't know how long it's been an issue where they're not being promptly. I just know for the past few months that has been a problem because when I've been looking for it, I've seen that as a problem. And it's also been a problem about the hybrid meetings because I've been doing this for a few months now. And it's not acceptable anymore. It never was, but now it's just even more less acceptable because you can't say so you don't know about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Dan Cobble. Um, I would just like to say that I support the SMID. Um, I think the people who've been spearheading this effort are assets to our community, and like especially Angie Jordan and just other folks have been, I mean, they pour so much heart and effort into uh, the South District, and just, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's always been a beautiful neighborhood, but I'm really excited to see what, uh, what the neighborhood can do with the SMID. I think it's going to really, um, help make it even more, a much more brighter place. Um, that said, I would also like to say that I think the discussion tonight would have been a lot different if, if the, the accessibility concerns that we've been discussing had already been addressed. Um, I have a feeling that there would have been a lot more people in the community here talking about how important this is if they didn't have to come in person. Um, I think it would have, the accessibility concerns that we've been discussing, I think it's such a simple fix. People have been talking to you about them for eight months and months and months. And um, I don't, I mean, I, I know why uh, the city government's been dragging their feet about it. It's because they don't, they want to stem the public comment. They don't want people pitching in. They don't want public input. Um, it's really rid ridiculous. Um, and I think it, it harms the, the community at large. Um, people should be able to engage with their government. And I think at, in 2021, the having hybrid meetings and publishing transcripts, I think that's just a given. Y'all should do it. And as seen by uh, in the last agenda item, when, the, when you, Mayor Teague, uh, had a special session, it's so easy to do. I mean, y'all could just have a recess right now and just be like, okay, we're going to set this up in uh, Friday the 17th at 1030 or whenever you finish what it, the talking about the precinct maps. You could handle it then and there, but you won't. And I mean, it's like this evening has been super embarrassing because it, it really shows the reluctance of the city government to embrace changes for the better for our community in regards to these accessibility concerns. Um, I, 
it's it's just embarrassing. And I mean, the people at the end of the day who suffer from this are the people who want to come here and engage with the city government, give you their concerns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I would also like to commend uh, Councillor Burgess for recusing herself. I know recently there have been some things where some city councillors should have been recusing themselves from discussions and didn't. Um, so I think that if, as Thank long you. as that's the norm, I think that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Karen Cubby, and I'm a local business owner, family-owned business. And I want to talk about the beauty of the SMID as a business person. Um, certainly what wasn't talked about was that all the legal parameters for the petition are have been met. And I want to talk about the importance of that. It's one of the savviest things the state legislature has done in the last 20 years is to require that to have the legal parameters met, that 25% of unique owners are represented by signatures, and that 25% of the assessed value of the property within the SMID is represented by those signatures. So what that means in practical terms is that it can't just be big business owners who dictate this. And it can't just be small business owners or property owners. It has to be a collaboration of a variety of property owners to bring this to your attention. And one of the questions that the Planning and Zoning Commission was, well, there's only 25% or a little bit above represented on the petition. But if we had 25% of registered voters voting in local elections, we'd think that that was a really big deal and a lot of people participated. So what it means for my business is that I pay an extra $600 a year. Well, I could maybe buy a couple of small ads somewhere, maybe five radio ads, but instead my $600 investment leverages over a million dollars in the downtown district for marketing, for clean things, for, for greening things up. And I cannot make that kind of investment and get that kind of return anywhere else. So this really makes a lot of sense. So besides the legal parameters that have been met, there's some other pieces of formula that people in this room represent that are gonna make it a success. And one is there's a volunteer base that have proven themselves, that have their champions of the area, they know their neighborhood, they're willing to work, and they have a lot of enthusiasm. That can carry you a long way. The other thing is, is that the plan has paid staff. And I'm telling you, as someone who has worked within the SMID without a paid staffer, where I basically was a volunteer director for a while, you need the paid staff to make things happen. I have a family, I have the business to run, I have some personal life I'd like to have. And so you can't, when you have staff, you have people whose job it is to pay attention and to live out the mission and the directives of the volunteer board. And so the South District has all those elements. They're already successful and they're just gonna go wild once this happens. So I hope that you will enthusiastically and unanimously vote yes for the SMID District. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to give first consideration? Move to give first consideration. Second, Mims. Moved by Salise, seconded by Mims. Council discussion. Mayor, if I can just interject one um, uh, piece of information kind of before you begin your council discussion. Because we don't see SMID uh, ordinances before you frequently, I wanted to remind the council that this requires a three-fourths vote uh, to pass. Uh, with Councilor uh, Burgess's recusal uh, due to a legal conflict, uh, she does not count, so five votes would be required to pass this item. Thank you. I'm happy to support this. Um, I was on the council when the downtown Schmid uh, came before us, and it was kind of a first time as a city council we looked at that sort of an entity and, and really kind of a new process, a new, you know, educational experience, I think, for everybody on the council and a lot of people in the community. Certainly took a while to get, you know, signatures and the support and everything. And so I just really want to commend all of the volunteers, um, starting with Angie Jordan and everybody else who have put so much time and effort 
into getting this to this point, educating people, explaining what this can do, um, and how it can benefit the whole South District. And you know what we saw in the downtown area in terms of trying to get those signatures at first was nobody wanted to pay the extra taxes. Um, they were really concerned about you know why they should have to pay that and what they were going to get for it. And I think it's become very very clear. Um, that that can be very beneficial. And as Karen Cubby said, the way you can leverage money um, when you group it together and or allows you sometimes to get in positions of doing grants. So I will very, very happily um, support this mid for the South District. I, I too am really excited um, by this project and by the, uh, the way this project has arrived to the City Council. Um, with its grassroots emphasis. Um, you know, in my experience, great cities are made up of great neighborhoods or districts and great neighborhood commercial districts. So this, this district is being trans, the commercial district is being transformed from a kind of a highway oriented uh, commercial district to something that's turning now toward the South District. And uh, becoming more neighborhood oriented as a result of that. Um, you know, Karen mentioned the 25% of the participants, the property owners have to, um, you know, they set that, that bar. As, as you said, I think, you know, that's just a start. I, I'm sure as this thing begins to take off, you'll see a larger percentage of the property owners joining in. They just are on the fence right now. Um, but once the success of the Schmidt becomes evident, you know, that percentage would increase. So, you know, congratulations to everyone who has been working on this. I see this as, you know, the next step in the evolution of the South District, uh, which I think is impressing all of us in terms of uh, identifying themselves as a district and strengthening themselves in so many ways. Um, so I'm very supportive of this, and as Angie had think, said at the very beginning, you know, this is really something happening within the context of neighborhood, uh, a neighborhood vision, uh, which I think is an important thing to keep in mind as well. I'm also in favor of this ordinance amending uh, Title III to establish the SMID. Um, we received an email, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who it came from, but it was from a community member that described this mid as a grand intersection of business and community. And I thought that was a great description. It really uh, suits this and describes it well. And as we heard in the passion of Angie Jordan, and thank you, Angie, for all that you've done for the South District, um, the South District residents believe in themselves and their ability to grow. They really do, and they really have hope for that. And this, I believe, is a win-win situation uh, for everyone, uh, and it'll help enhance the efforts uh, to revitalize and enrich this area. For me, I think this is, was really something new to me. I, even though I know the downtown district for a long time, I served on the board at a point of time, but I wasn't know that you have to go through all this just to get that thing approved. I saw this is something, you know, they can take it for granted and that's it. But like seeing you, like Angie and the, your group who going do all this work by reaching out to the businesses and going through writing and zoning and come back to us and doing the survey and doing all this public hearing. You know, this is really incredible work that you have done. And uh, I'm glad to support this. And this is really going to be like uh, for the favor. Uh, it will, as I said, will unite the community and also this is will give like opportunity for business to like new business to be open in that area. Yeah, I'm happy to support it. I just, I, I will join the chorus. I don't have much, to, I, I don't know that I can really say anything that hasn't already been said. The only thing that I could, that I would add is that I'm really happy to see not just that this is, was a, is it was really a truly a grassroots effort and will continue to be one, but that it's supported by all the economic development organizations in the city here, as well as the existing Schmidt. So um, it's really a win-win for the community. It's been uh, super encouraging to see all of the partners coming together, but specifically seeing uh, those that live in the South District. Um, 
actually engaging through the process, being overwhelmed um, through all the requirements, but going through the process and really being very intentional on reaching out, making sure that they understood clearly what it all meant. And I don't know if you sat through any of the presentations by uh, those that were doing the SMID, but I was super impressed. I was like, oh my God, this is, uh, it's very descriptive, given a, a vision of what they saw. And it was also the energy, it was contagious. Um, and they also recognized that there were some business owners that, you know, were not on board. And, and they gave their reasons why. And I think they listened with understanding and compassion and really just continue to state why they wanted, uh, why they felt that this was the best for the community. And I'm so happy to uh, see this before us today, and I'm gonna support it. All right, I think we're ready for a vote. Roll call, please. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess abstaining? Mims? Yes. Motion passes six to zero with one recusal. <coughs> Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved. Second. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Salee. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero with one recusal. Item number 12, Benton Street. Reha rehabilitation. Just give a minute. <laughs> Item number 12, Benton Street Rehabilitation. This is a resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the Benton Street Rehabil Rehabilitation Project, establishing the amount of bids, security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for bid receipts. I'm gonna open the public hearing and welcome staff. Good evening, my name is Melissa Klo. I'm with uh, Engineering Division, Public Works. Um, due to um, how close Willow Creek is to the Benton Street project, I'm going to combine both of them into this one presentation to discuss. Um, really quick background on Benton Street. The project corridor is from Greenwood Drive west to Mormon Trek Boulevard. Um, and there was a previous project for diamond grinding um, completed on Benton Street to smooth out the ride. Um, the joints were beginning to deteriorate and the ride quality was, was not good. Since then, the pavement has continued to deteriorate and it's in, a, it's in bad shape right now. Um, the MPOJC has programmed 1.3 million in STBG funding in the fiscal year 21. Project overview, um, this project will be partially funded by the Iowa DOT. This includes a crack and seat of the existing pavement with a three inch asphalt overlay. Um, crack and seat is a process where um, a piece of equipment similar to the photo um, up there right now will drop a hammer approximately over two feet and break up the rigid pavement. Um, then we'll overlay with with asphalt. Side street intersection reconstruction will occur with ADA sidewalk improvements. Pavement widening and signal improvements will occur at sunset, at the sunset intersection for a more efficient intersection. Water main and storm sewer improvements will also take place during the project as needed and we will have um, new five foot bike lanes on both sides of Benton. The estimated construction cost is 3.2 million. Project timeline is tonight, we're holding the public hearing and improving plans and specifications. This will lead into the Iowa DOT bid letting 
on January 19th with an award date approximately February 1st. Uh, there's been a late start date set for May 23rd, 2022, with final completion sometime this fall. There are 100 working days that have been allocated for the project. To review um, the Stream Bank Stabilization Project really quick, it is adjacent to Benton Street. Um, it was considered um, to combine these projects at one time, but given the specialization of work um, for stream bank stabilization compared to what is being done on Benton Street, they are being handled in, as two separate projects. Recent storm events have accelerated the stream bank erosion along the portion of Willow Creek. Um, if this continues, we expect that erosion will undermine the sidewalk and potentially damage public infrastructure if it is left unfixed. Um, as you can see in the photo on the right, many of the trees in the park are being eroded and roots are being exposed. Um, this project includes the reconstruction of Willow Creek, including rock riffle grade control and riprap steam stream bank armoring. So it will actually be um, the... Um, Sorry, I had a mind block. <laughs> um, we'll be taking the stream and moving it a little bit south of where it currently is, away from Benton Street and the sidewalk to help with issues like this in the future. Estimated construction cost is 170,000. Um, project timeline for this project is to hold the public hearing, approve plans and specifications. Um, tonight, the bid letting is a local bid letting. It'll occur January 11th, 2022, with an award date shortly following, approximately January 18th. Construction start will be this winter, towards the end of February, with a fi final completion date this spring. Questions or comments? Uh, Melissa, uh, John Thomas. Um, was there any neighborhood outreach associated with this project? We will be planning to have neighbor, a neighborhood meeting prior to construction to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, has there been, a, I recently inherited this project, so. For this one, there really hasn't been a whole lot of uh, uh, neighborhood outreach. We've treated it similar to what we've done for overlay. So we've uh, made information about the project available online and um, for, I guess, general consumption, but nothing specific to the neighborhood. Yeah, the, the other I would include in, in this notion of neighborhood outreach, uh, the bicycle community with the, uh, the Benton Street uh, project. Yeah. We, we plan before construction begins to have um, more neighborhood outreach and let people know what that phasing will look like and, and what will be going on there. Okay, great, thanks. I guess just one thing I would add is this is one project that we have had previous discussions with the Bicycle Advisory Committee. So I think as far as the bicycle group goes, this is one that's been out there for a while and one that we've been discussing with them in the past. And really what it's doing is sort of formalizing the, the bicycle path that's there now. I think there's some confusion right now as far as what's actually out there on Benton Street. So this will go from striped, uh, striped uh, shoulder to actual bike lanes. It'll be widening in other words. Uh, I don't, you didn't talk about dimensions, but I, I think the, uh, the existing condition is a three foot wide shoulder or, or whatever you want to call it and it's going to a five foot wide bike lane. Correct, yeah, so the actual total pavement width will stay the same. We're just reallocating, so we're narrowing up the lanes and adding those bicycle lanes. So I, I think in the report it was 11 foot lanes and five foot wide bicycle lanes, is that, is that correct? Yep. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Please come forth. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed Terori here again, Chair of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, I'm not sure if 
this is more of a question or a clarification, but once again, just noticing the numbers on the board for this project, also the timeline from approval to when the project would begin to when it would be completed, and thinking about the contrast to our facilitator plan um, and also that timeline and how that was dealt with. So I guess my question right now is, um, is this typical in terms of a range of time for one submitting a plan, getting construction started and completing the plan and the amount of community outreach completed? Uh, I don't know that you can actually give me that answer now, so I guess I would just direct this question to City Manager Jeff Fruin and also City Attorney um, Mr. Goers, is it? Um, when it comes to Freedom of Information Act requests, if it's related to a commission's work, how is that paid for? Because I have looked on the state websites about it, and I'm interested in quite a few FOIAs at this point in time, and I just kind of want an estimate on uh, how that would need to work. Yep. And I, again, they'll be able to have conversation outside of this meeting. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, Noah, as you know, and as you know why I'm standing here once again, is because I'm calling on you to call for a special meeting. So we have accessible meetings before waiting until January for potentially doing that. And just the need for accessibility is now, well, it was actually yesterday, but like now is the best we can do for you for calling the meeting. So we don't have to wait and have more and more unaccessible meetings and to wait for a new council to, do you want to like start a new council with having inaccessible meetings, <laughs> really? Is that the best way to start that? The answer is no, by the way. That was, in case I wasn't clear. Um, so yeah, are you gonna do that? Because you can, you, you showed how easy it is to call special meetings earlier this evening, like 30 minutes ago, whatever. Was that too hard to do it a second time? Is accessibility like that big of a burden or something? It's not, but you're acting like it is. People should not have to wait and for accessibility when you should have never taken it away to begin with. And if or when COVID ever ends, um, never take away Zoom because it's not just about the pandemic. That's disabling. I mean, that's arguably probably the worst because people don't want to risk death to come here, which is obviously fair for them. I, I, I wouldn't want to either, and I shouldn't have to. But like you said, single mothers who would like to make this meeting, but they don't want to really bring their children because I mean those two bullet child once I come to one of these meetings, let's be honest. And so that's one example of people. Um, so yeah, it's it's not hard. You could do it right now, but you're choosing not to. And that's not all right. I hope you know that. I don't know if you know that, but how many times do I have to say it for you to get it? Do you show how earlier, to, how easy it is earlier to do a special meeting, how you can do that right now? So do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Hi, um, I would just like to reiterate some of my previous uh, comments regarding accessibility. Um, it is very, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous the where we're at right now regarding this issue because, I mean, it's, it's so easy for, I mean, what we've been asking is just for 
y'all to do the bare minimum with this. It's been, folks have been asking this for months. Um, I mean, you could declare a special work session for it or a special just, I mean, just, it's so easy. There are so many alternatives to where we're at right now. I mean, even earlier in this meeting, there's no reason for Noah and I to have been up here talking or like talking as much as we have been. Because, I mean, Mr. Mayor, you could have taken steps to just reaffirm your commitment, the commitment of this council to pushing for this accessibility, um, whether that's calling a recess or just s establishing a special work session, which y'all could easily do on Friday the 17th after the precinct map, uh, whatever that is. Um, but... It's just wild to me that this is where we're at. I mean, it's so simple because, I mean, even though the county has lots of problems, their meetings are so accessible. In reg I mean, not in regards to transcripts, but in regards to being able to zoom in. I mean, I think it's such a healthy thing for the city government to change for it to an act. And I mean, for all the time that people have been advocating for this, saying that it's on, uh, it's scheduled for a work session is not enough. Um, so I'm just going to repeat that we have, we're on agenda item 12. We have four more public hearings this evening. And I really don't want to come up here and talk during them. I mean, I will. But, I mean, it, it would almost be easier if we could just go and do a quick recess and just, I mean, everybody on the council who will be here in January just of, off the record affirm their commitment to implementing this change or establishing uh, a session within the next week to uh, talk about this and vote on it and just make this change, uh, this change before the meeting in January. I would like to reiterate that we're coming into winter when it will be harder for folks to come to these meetings. I mean, I know folks who take the bus here and it's just, it's so, it's so messed up all the hoops that they have to jump through to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So move, <coughs> Thomas. Second, Mims. Council discussion? I think these are both really uh, timely and important projects, uh, so I'm glad they're uh, moving forward together. Um, on, on Benton Street, you know, there's pretty significant change in the uh, allocation of the pavement for uh, as a travel lane for vehicles and the bike lane, so that's, that's also ad advancing things. I think we, I, I'm, I am concerned um, with how, given how much traffic and uh, traffic speed we have on Benton, if a five foot wide bike lane without any kind of uh, protection will work. Um, so we'll just have to see. I mean, I, I think we've established the lane and, and I think then it's just a question of observing to see if that's adequate, an adequate provision so that we get more than just the, you know, the, the diehards <laughs> who uh, make up maybe 5% of our bike, biking population and um, see if we can attract a wider, more diverse bike riding community. All right. Roll call, please. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 13 is Willow Creek Stream Banks Stabilization Improvements. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of the cost for the construction of the Willow Creek Stream Banks Stabilization Improvements Project. Establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid. Directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open up the public hearing. And we already have the staff comments. And so uh, anyone from the public like to address this topic, please come forth. 
Is this Fucker. for item 13 or 14? Item yeah, 15. number 13. Number 13, okay. Um, last thing I just wanted to add on this is that um, following up on the FOIA thing, um, wanting to know a little bit more about uh, the amount of money spent in each area of town throughout um, the last few decades, uh, particularly as well um, instances where residential areas were converted to um, commercial zones. And um, on top of that as well, uh, the amount of funding the city has directly given uh, out of city taxes and also out of state funding that was allocated to these projects and also um, development groups involved. Um, so pretty much it, but I'll follow up via email for more of that information. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, uh, Noah. Um, do I have to do it again? <laughs> you know I'm here. Um, and also, but some more accessible problems in this city is uh, tomorrow is supposed to be a uh, very worrying thunder, uh, not thunder, uh, windstorm coming through. I mean, you should be looking at people who could get seriously hurt because they don't have shelter. Please, shelter please address your comments to item yes, number 13. Because people's lives are at Willow risk Creek, tomorrow Bank, because there is a severe, there is a severe windstorm coming tomorrow throughout the, throughout the, throughout the state that's going to hit this city. And people do not have shelter. They do not have the shelter house shelter to go into. Where are they supposed to go? And how does this relate to item 13? Because people are going to get hurt. They're going to lose all their stuff. And this city could, right now, say you're going to open up your facilities so for people who do not have shelter, have shelter. They need it now, and they especially need it tomorrow when we're going to have a severe weather event that's going to be happening hit this city. That's going to harm people. And you have the moral Noah. responsibility as the city no provide the this isn't facilities on item number 13 have. are you and going to provide the we're facilities done. people you can stop the clock oh no because next you one. will not are you going to let people get hurt in your city next are you who, going anyone to else like is to address city going this to topic open facilities tomorrow anyone else is, like is to the address city this going topic? to open facilities tomorrow because this is urgent this is needed right now are, are they going to do that because people are going to get hurt if you don't do that that's the plain fact are they going Respect to be still, are, is the city going to have shelter for people who want and need shelter tomorrow? It is urgent. Is that going to happen? Any anyone yes else like no. to address this to topic? Happen? Are you going to let those people's Noah, injuries please be on your hands? Are, I want to know if there's going to be shelter for people who need it tomorrow. This is me and this is Mayor Pro Tem's last time here. People, please. there is a severe be, weather be event happening of tomorrow. Our leadership. That, that's, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, <laughs> do you want to see people get hurt? I'm assuming you don't. I know you don't. Noah. So, is the city going to is, have shelter for people okay. tomorrow? Anyone else like to address this no. topic? Are you going to have shelter for people who need it tomorrow? It's not acceptable if okay. you're not going to have that shelter available for them tomorrow. I want if anyone else wants to address this Are topic, please raise your hand. Are you going to have shelter available for them Or tomorrow? else I'm going to close the public close hearing. Public close it then. Yep. Closing the public hearing. All right. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Mims. Are you going to Second, have Taylor. shelter for those people? Council discussion. I had my hand raised. I already closed the public you hearing. You have to reopen it. You can make your hand if you want to comment. We're on council discussion. Uh, any, any Mr. discussion? Mayor, no, you said raise your hand if you want to make a comment. I raised my hand and then you closed the, the pu public hearing. Is already, this is illegal. It's already closed. Uh, I'm just going to go and talk about accessibility. Um, sir, you, you could reopen the public comment. You said if anybody else wants to comment, raise your hand. I raised my hand. Sir, please respect my ability to make topical comments on this agenda item. Re you can have the council reopen discussion about this. Sir, please. We're, we're going to go ahead and have discussion. I'm going to talk about. So, um, can someone put my three minutes? I'll I'll time myself. Uh, three minutes. Let me just put it. X. Three minutes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, we're talking about Zoom meetings, and we need to have hybrid meetings in this council. And I'm sorry, sir, but you close. You said if anybody wants to comment, 
They can comment. I raised my hand. I did not see your hand at the time when I made the comment. I raised it. I'm pretty sure if you go back to the video, you could see it in the video. Okay. Um, But it's extremely ableist that the city does not have hybrid meetings. Um, And honestly, Mr. Mayor, it's... It's just really wild that, I mean, we, there was no reason for us to filibuster this evening. There really wasn't. You've been given t- chance, 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 even before tonight, months, to have, hi- to have the discussion about hybrid meetings, and you haven't. Um, furthermore, I would just like to talk about the way that you've disrespected the public during public comment. I mean, even we're trying to this shut This is item number 13. Sh- will I'm talking about will, acce- accessibility. Will I still have one minute and 57 on my clock. Okay. Um, so such as when you were having the TRC discussions, you tried to shut out the public. Commissioner Wangui came up here and tried to talk, and you wouldn't let her. You wouldn't reopen this is it. This item number 13. And we're talking about accessibility and the way that the hostile way you, Mr. Mayor, have reacted to the public when they've tried to make public comments. And I'm sorry, but whether it's hybrid meetings or you shutting out women of color, sir, you have done uh, a very terrible job. Do not job. talk to me about shutting out a woman of color. This well, is item number 13. You've literally done that, sir. William, sir, you've done that. You Willow didn't let Creek's, Commissioner Wangui talk this when it was is after Creek the TRC Stream work Bank session. You didn't let anybody in the TRC come and share how, what the work that they were doing. You didn't let even invite them to the damn meeting. So I, I frankly, I think your leadership is is extremely suspect i think when the next council comes they should have a new mayor sir i really think that they should um and i mean the, this evening you could have just stopped this right by saying hey we're just going to take a quick recess and commit to this accessibility and you haven't when i i you said if anybody mayor? wants to comment raise mayor? your hand i raised my hand mayor can we call the yeah. question on item 13 please yes we can um, thank you i still have 30 seconds left on my clock so i'm going to keep going the public hearing's already been closed excuse me it was i raised my hand when the mayor said if someone wants to raise their hand to talk Finish. raise you your got hand about to 20 talk. minutes 20 seconds and then well so i do have 20 seconds thank you for timing me Okay. Um, but, I mean, it's a form of ableism. It's ridiculous. And, I mean, the way that you've, in regards to public comment, Mr. Mayor, the way you've treated the TRC members after the last work session was ridiculous. Lots of TRC members have wanted to come and zoom into these meetings via hybrid meetings, and they have not been able to. My timer is going. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're, um, we're, we're in council discussion. Any discussion by council? on the Willow Creek Stream Bank Stabilization Improvements? I, just that it's really important that the neighborhood be informed of what's going on here, that it's a neighborhood that, that's, that focuses a lot on, on Willow Creek Park, and I really want to make sure that I will vote for this, but I also want to make sure that they're well informed in advance of what's happening here and why. Okay. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 14, First Avenue Scott Boulevard intersection improvements. This is a resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the First Avenue and South Boulevard intersection improvements project, establishing the amount of bid security to accompany each bid directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. Welcome. Council and Mayor, my name is Justin Harlan. I'm a senior civil engineer with the Engineering Division of Public Works. I'm here to talk about the First Avenue and Scott Boulevard intersection improvements project. Um, this has been in front of Council before and presented. So just a little background, uh, First Avenue and Scott Boulevard is currently a four-way stop controlled by stop signs <clears throat> and it was noticed that 
the configura configuration experiences significant queuing during peak hours, resulting in increased traffic times, delays, and emissions. In 2015, uh, we decided to do a roundabout feasibility analysis. Um, that led to um, the finding that a roundabout would be feasible and acceptable at this location. As this progressed, um, we went in 2019 and hired Strand and Associates to complete an intersection control evaluation, or ICE, that further, con <clears throat> further confirmed that a roundabout would be acceptable at this location and improve the intersection. Um, the ICE determined a signalized intersection and a single lane roundabout would operate acceptably for the design year. The roundabout was selected because it acted similarly at the overall peak hour of operations and better on the off peak hour operations. Um, there were similar construction costs, but there's lower maintenance costs because of the non-signalized intersection. <clears throat> it improves both vehicle and pedestrian safety and reduces emissions because of reduced travel times. So just a little overview about the, what this project <coughs> includes. Um, you have pavement improvements, the construction of the roundabout. There are public underground utilities that, that will be improved, such as storm sewer and water main. There will be ADA sidewalk improvements and new street lighting. That concludes the project overview, and I'll open up to questions after I go through the project timeline. Um, we're holding the public hearing tonight. Uh, the bid letting is scheduled for January 11th. We'll award on the 18th, go to construction April 4th, and then final completion should be around the time of July 8th, 2022. Now I'll open up to questions. Any questions? So the entire roundabout is going to be done by them? That is the intent, yes. Okay. A lot faster than I expected. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Please come forth now. Welcome. Hello, Noah. Um, yes, to go out accessibility of this, you already know what I'm going to say about accessibility of this. And now on the even more urgent matter is there is a severe weather event happening in this city tomorrow. There's no shelter for people experiencing houselessness. Is there going to be shelter for those people tomorrow in that adverse extreme weather event that is coming to this town? tomorrow or, or they just or is this they just going to leave them out there without any shelter for them if they want it and this this is a very important to answer this because it's literally happening tomorrow so you're just going to let people get hurt is that what this city is going to do or are you going to open your facilities and provide shelter for people who need it it's unacceptable if you're not going to do that. And I need an answer, and they need an answer. People's lives are literally at stake at this, and you have the chance to help people to not get hurt. And you're choosing to remain silent on this, and that is unacceptable, that is immoral. Look into your heart, as you like to say, and say something, and say right now you're opening up facilities for people who need it. People's lives are at stake, and you, Screw your rules, whatever they are, because obviously you don't care about your own rules because you will break them if you want to. You're just choosing not to break rules at this so-called rules about commenting when people's lives are literally at stake for this. Like this isn't something you can set a meeting for in the future. This is tomorrow. The weather event is coming. Strong high winds are coming tomorrow. And who knows what other weather stuff is going to go down, like tornadoes. Like we, How many people died over the weekend because of the tornadoes? The, because we have, we're gonna have like our record breaking levels of heat in this runway. That's how you get tornadoes. And we're already gonna have like the strong, high gusts of winds everywhere and put tornadoes in the house up possibly. And there are people who do not have houses, they do not have shelter, 
shelter house currently does not have their normal winter health shelter for people to have it there's no shelter for these people available and they need that shelter tomorrow their lives are literally at stake and you are choosing to remain silent about that and that is morally abhorrent and that is wrong you need to say something you need to open facilities up right now this is urgent i hope do you understand that if you don't believe me at the weather look, look, look up on google what's coming to iowa weather event and you will see high winds, I think something about, I saw something about 70 plus winds, probably more than that. I mean, probably much like the derecho show we had last year. I know I didn't say that right, but you know what I'm talking about. Is the city going to just let people not have shelter when you have the facilities to have shelter for people? Because that's happened in the past. There's been Thank facilities you. for people. Uh, Anyone else like to address this topic? Are you going to provide shelter for people? This can't wait. The, uh, the, you realize that, right? It's happening tomorrow and in the future too. But like, this, especially because of the weather event tomorrow. I'm gonna stop talking. Yeah. Good. Welcome. Hi. Um, I would just like to say that uh, I think the the point Noah brings up about the weather also can feed into the accessibility arguments that we've been making tonight. Because I think if you we're in winter, we're in December. Um, you're asking people, I mean, if the, if, for example, if this windstorm was happening tonight, right now, people in order to come and speak to this government would have to risk their personal safety to do so. Um, I think that people, and I mean, for example, I know a lot of people, I mean, I'm kind of a little bit too bullheaded to really care one way or the other, but I know a lot of people are concerned about coming here to speak about their experiences because they're afraid of the police. Um, my philosophy is if the cops arrest me, then I'm just going to say, fuck you all and fuck the city. But um, the thing is that I think this accessibility, there are so many good reasons why hybrid meetings are needed. We've talked about them. And I mean, I'm happy to stop right now if, if the counselors who will be here in January just right now on three raise their hands and say we will commit to this all right one two three nobody's committing to this that's the problem that's why the the we've been dragging out these public comments all evening and mr mayor as I, i've given you we've given you multiple ways to commit to doing this because as we've stated saying we're going to have a work session about this is not enough we need commitments to making these meetings accessible to everybody in this community because that way the people in the community will be able to engage with the agenda items that most affect their lives and um again mr mayor you I, as i said there i mean there have been multiple like i mean amel wanted to be here tonight and she couldn't because it's not a hybrid meeting so i mean it's not having this accessibility cramps down on and hampers the ability of so many people to engage in this politics, whether they be black women, old folks, folks who are disabled, whatever it is, it's ableist. We need to, I mean, and by not committing to making these changes as soon as possible, the city government is feeding into that ableism that's why we're doing this because we want to increase the and improve the civic process in this government and y'all are irritated at us i get it it's all it's past nine uh we've been here a while but at the same time we're just trying to improve this process for the future you can go with us or you can be against us but i mean by being against us you're just making this harder for yourselves because we're fighting the good fight Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So, so moved. Move. Second. Moved by Burgess. Burgess. Seconded by Salee. Council discussion. I will support this. I use that road a lot, uh, both Scott Boulevard and First Avenue, and see the backup of traffic um, during those peak times. It can get backed up from, uh, from First Avenue, sometimes not quite back to Fire Station 4, but pretty darn close at the worst times. 
Um, it moves through fairly quickly, I will say that, but still it does get really backed up. So the idea of having um, a roundabout where we can get that flat traffic flow um, to increase during those um, peak times, I think will be very beneficial. So I'd be glad to support this. I'm also excited about the roundabout and just an observation on kind of how we plan and the time that things take is, but just notice we had the feasibility study in 2015 and this should be completed in 2022. So that's seven years to transition a stop sign to a roundabout. Just, I, I think that's remarkable and not unusual, but worth just thinking about how our decisions are made. So like roundabouts. Yeah, I am glad that we're, going the way of the roundabout rather than the signalization, which kind of runs against the notion of just slowing the traffic when it goes through the intersection rather than bringing it to a full stop, because it's those full stops that end up with delays all through the day. Um, and it's really, we're addressing, I'm not sure how long this peak period is, but when I drive through there, there really isn't much of a backup. So having you know signals then would really be frustrating mm -hmm. um, uh, just to accommodate the backups during the during rush hour roundabouts. one thing I'd, oh, sorry, go ahead, yes. just uh, roundabout save fuel as well because you don't have to stop and start the one comment that i would make is as we add roundabouts um it's still clear that a lot of people don't know how to use them <laughs> so i don't know what the rules are for signage um but I would encourage the signage that says yield to the left to try and help educate people about how to use them. I, I don't know how many times I see people pulling into a roundabout and looking to the right and wanting to yield to the people to their right. Sure, so to me, putting, and I've seen them in some places, and putting up the signage that just says yield to the left, I think could be really helpful. I had, I had never experienced a roundabout until I was in... Um, Hilton Head, um, and it was a little scary, I have to tell you. Um, but as the, uh, I think the, what I did see on City Channel 4 was kind of a great presentation about roundabouts. Um, and so I think people in our community, as they're seeing more and more pop up, um, that presentation as well as signage, I think, would be helpful. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salih? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 15 is state CDBG, CV status of funded activities. This is a resolution approving the status of funded activities for CDBG dash CV funds received by the Iowa Economic Development Authority. And I'm gonna open the public comment. And welcome. Hi. Sorry, I don't know where my PowerPoint is. Well, it should be. I see. Just on the desktop there. Got it, thank you. All right, Erica Kubley with Neighborhood Services. Iowa City received three phases of CDBG CV funds totaling over 1.5 million to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. This agenda item focus, focuses on the third phase of funding in which Iowa City was awarded $686,610 from the Iowa Economic Development Authority. As a subrecipient of state funds, the city must comply with the state's citizen partici participation plan which requires a public meeting to discuss the status of funded activities and any changes to proposed activities uh, once we have expended 15% of the grant funds, which we have. Um, in our application for these funds, we proposed two different types of projects. First, um, we allocated 390,000 towards emergency housing payments. This program is administered by Shelter House and is a continuation of funding used in the first phase of CDBGCV dollars. We have reimbursed over 200,000 or 54% of those funds and 120 beneficiaries have been reported so far. Um, this update only includes funds drawn. 
So the amounts are a couple months behind due to our reimbursement and reporting process. So it's likely that the total expenditures and number of beneficiaries as of today is higher than this report. Um, all beneficiaries must be below 80% of the area median income and 110 of the 120 are below 30% of the area median income. And so this project is on schedule and exceeding its performance measures. Um, there is one change to the scope of work. Um, we initially allocated $20,000 for city admin for this project, but did not use any admin internally. So we plan to reallocate those dollars to project expenses. Um, our second activity for state CDBGCV funding was nonprofit operational expenses in the amount of $296,610. These are for projects that are above and beyond the services a nonprofit offered before COVID. Um, funds were allocated to eight agencies to provide homeless prevention and services, child care services, mental health services, food assistance, and eviction prevention. We've spent nearly $172,000 or 59% on these projects to date. Um, altogether, they have served over about 3,000 community members. Um, all individuals or households are below 80% AMI. Um, we did have one project that came in under budget by about $4,200. So we plan to reallocate those funds to other project expenses. Um, we, in our initial application, we also set aside city admin funds for this activity, but we didn't take any admin. We allocated all to the public service activities. Uh, moving forward, we will be reallocating those unused dollars to existing activities and working with agencies to complete and close out their projects. Um, we're required to have 80% of funds drawn by July 2023, um, but I expect we'll be near completion by the end of this fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thanks. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, Noah. Um, so here we have an item that is literally about housing. And tomorrow, there is an extreme weather event that's going to be hitting this city. You even like have that on your own Iowa City, uh, city Facebook page saying that here's this adverse weather event happening tomorrow. Um, so you should be aware of that uh, there is no shelter, excess shelter currently. Shelter House is the only shelter for houseless pe people in the council in this county. I'm, or I'm aware of. Uh, I guess the Catholic Worker House does some stuff to serve to other people, but the main shelter, shelter, shelter house, and they currently are at capacity. They have waiting lines, so there's not enough available. Well, they're currently available. But you could, this city right now, could make housing, at least at a minimum temporary housing shelter for tomorrow and the entire winter, for that matter, well, since you're already doing it, but especially tomorrow because there's an extreme weather event happening in this city and people don't have shelter. And this city has facilities, has places to provide shelter. If you don't do that, you are choosing and that is on your hands. I hope you know that is on all your hands. If you choose to stay silent on this, if you do not open up your facilities tonight for people who need shelter, it is unacceptable, completely wrong. I don't know how you can go to sleep at night if you allow that to happen. I sure as hell know I wouldn't be able to. If I was in a position of power and I knew we had extreme weather happening the next day and I did nothing, and it's my position of power in said city to provide shelter for those people who need shelter for protection from extreme weather events that are likely happening because of climate change. That's one that's going to screw the future. That my generation, generations after me have no hope for the future. This is just a, just a little glimpse of what it's going to be like for the future. But right now, so that you can help save people, save lives, stop injuries, providing opening your facilities for people right now because they need it right now. It is wrong if you're just going to sit there silently and let that happen. So you're just going to sit there silently and let that happen is what I'm hearing. Any of you are Jeff, this might be you think are you, is the city going to have facilities for people who need shelter tomorrow? Please address this council. 
How about you, Redmond? Is there going to you let houseless people not have shelter tomorrow? Please address this council. And Susan, you going to let houseless people not have shelter tomorrow? Janice, you going to let houseless people not have shelter tomorrow? Pauline, you going to let houseless people not have shelter Thank tomorrow? You. Bruce, Thank are you. you not? Are you going Thank to you. stop people who need shelter from having shelter tomorrow? Thank you. That's disgusting. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Dan Cobble, and I am just I'm just here to uh, repeat some of the other talking points that I've gone through this evening. Um, I mean, y'all know what I'm going to say, and I, again, will give you the chance for folks on the council who will be here in January, if you commit now to, uh, to hybrid meetings, just raise your hand and I will go back to my seat. So again, one, two, three. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll talk for another two and two minutes and 20 seconds. Um, again, there are so many people in this community who would benefit from hybrid meetings and the antagonism that has been shown to this, uh, to, to hybrid meetings by the city council is it's, it's egregious. I mean, from pushing this item back from when it was first proposed several months ago to tonight, where, Mr. Mayor, you're not even calling a quick recess to just tell us, the people who are pushing for this, hey, we're going to work on this. I mean, it, it's messed up. And I get that y'all don't like us, but we're, what we're pushing for, it's the right thing. And it's, I mean, I, for us to be skeptical of what has you all pushing this down to a work session, we have reason to be skeptical because the city government has been so hostile to other basic demands that we've brought up. Hey, city government, maybe we shouldn't have the cops use tanks. Hey, city government, maybe you should protect business owners from racist landlords. I mean, we've brought so many things to this council and this council has just kicked the can down the road and said, we're not going to do anything about that. Um, it's, it's egregious. And I would just like to add one thing, Mr. Mayor, that during the campaign, you were talking about how important it was for people, local businesses and local people to visit the, my, the boutiques owned by minority women, especially immigrant minority women. Mr. Mayor... Na was furious about that because you have never been into her boutique once. And the reason why this is topical is because Na would love to call. She's a very busy person. But she can't call into these meetings because you don't have a Zoom option. She's been wanting to tell you how bullshit that was for months, sir. It's crazy. Um, I mean, the, there, there are so many things about the city government that are rotten. This is one of them. I mean, we could talk for hours about this. And if the city government continues dragging its heels regarding the accessibility, you. we Thank will. You. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Um, thank you, uh, Mohamed Traore. Um, I just have a clarification question. Just the way the line is written in terms of comment. Sorry, I'm just a very literal person. Uh, it says Iowa Economic Development Authority to prevent, and then sentence ends with the COVID-19 pandemic. Just really confused on how that's written. Was that how they actually wrote it when they allocated these funds? I'm just, I just don't really understand how they were preventing the, the pandemic in itself. And then also with um, the organizations are all excellent, all great, but with that wording in there, I'm just interested to know how we're planning to allocate funds to do this in itself in terms of preventing the pandemic um, the mental health services phenomenal child care services homeless prevention everything great but in terms of an action plan in itself and how that actually um, affected prevention i think we may end up needing some kind of report on that in itself just based on how that was written uh, thank you thank you anyone else want to comment on this Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Wait, public comment time. Um, well, close the public hearing. And then can I get a motion to approve? 
So moved, Mims. Second, Tyler. Council discussion. One thing I will say about, because um, these were some of the funds that have been allocated, um, they were to um, kind of prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, I know that at one point, the, and I'm not sure if this is what the, what the shelter house had in mind, um, but I know that some of their funds, we had placed people in hotels at one point um, to kind of separate individuals that may have contracted COVID-19 and so to prevent the spread within um, this, you know, the, the space where people were not uh, confirmed as having COVID-19 that was a part of the prevention plan. Um, and there was a lot of conversations about, you know, how do we respond um, and prepare. So that is um, at least my take on some of the things that happen uh, for these funds. I, I just want to make sure how much they said they left. I can't even see. How much was left? Mm -hmm. You want to acknowledge that, Eric, Erica? Um, we have a total of about 24,000 that's unallocated that we plan to um, reallocate into existing projects. Um, remaining available, there's 120,000 um, unspent that's allocated for the second activity, the nonprofit. Um, and then about 170,000 that has not been drawn through the shelter house program. But I will um, make a note that that's not um, up to date. It's a couple months outdated. No, I, I really specifically mean the money for uh, rent and utility prevention, like rent and utility, how much left at the shelter house for that? Um, we, haven't, we haven't gotten a draw recently, but um, this, is, this is the number as of their most recent draw. I don't, like have, the, I don't have the exact number as of today. 100? It's, um, let's see, 100, about 170,000. And when did, we had, when did we start giving out this money? Um, I believe, so this is a continuation of our first phase of the CDBGCV fund. So when we ran out of that money, we just started with the second, um, with the second allocation. And I believe it was um, towards the beginning of, the, of this year. Yeah, but the whole thing started last year, summer of last year. Yeah, I guess, yes, I really see a lot of need in the community. And I, still we have money there, that's very interesting. And, but I know that now we are doing like helping people through IFA and we, and we want the people to like spend as much as we can from the state so they can get help like even more than three months that we have. Uh, but there is many, many people who are not eligible for that. Uh, you know, I hope, I guess they want to see we still have money. That's really concerning me when I see money left and there is a lot need on the community. There are some people who are not eligible for the state money and we still see that money sitting there. That's what I'm saying. So I don't know, this is anyway, this is my last time can comment on that, but I, uh, I might come and be behind that podium and talk about it, but still, I firsthand see the needs on the community, and uh, we need like really, you know, just faster service or maybe something like that. Yeah. If I could just clarify for council, what you're seeing here is a very small snapshot of the total relief package, even the total relief package that Shelter House is administering. So again, this is round two, uh, which means they fully expent round one funds. And we also have our local funds that we layered on top of this uh, to, to really address folks that couldn't qualify for a state funds like this. And the shelter house has received uh, COVID relief dollars direct, not even passed through through the, through the city as well. And then of course we could layer on IFA, HACAP, and other funding that, that may be out there. So I don't, don't, just don't want you to uh, think that this is the only relief, rent relief, uh, utility relief that's out there. There's multiple, multiple layers. And as you know, each one may have its own unique um, eligibility uh, rules. 
Yeah, I just believe the city was helping a lot during this pandemic, and we're ahead of many cities in the county that we are doing this. And a lot of people from Iowa City has been benefit from this. And if we compare them with other cities, so that's a plus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any other council discussion? Roll call, please. Thomas? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 16, fiscal year 22 annual action plan amendment number 1. This is a resolution approving substantial amendment number 1 to Iowa City fiscal year 2022 annual action plan. And I'm going to open the public comment or the public hearing. Welcome. Well, uh, all right, Erica Kubli with Neighborhood Services. Um, this is a substantial amendment to the FY22 current year annual action plan to incorporate additional, additional project awards into the plan. Um, the city did not receive enough applications in our initial CDBG and home competitive funding round last year to allocate all the available funds. So a second mid-year funding round was held recently to accept additional projects and allocate any available funds. Um, five projects were submitted with over a million dollars in funding requests. Um, a total of 656,000 in funds was available for allocation. HCDC scored the applications and made the recommendations that are shown here. Um, 300,000 in home funds was awarded to Shelter House for their 501 project, which is permanent supportive housing for people experiencing chronic homelessness using the housing first approach. 100,000 in home funds was awarded to the city's South District program for home buyer down payment assistance for four additional units. Um, 128,000 in CDBG and home funds were awarded to a partnership between the city and Green State Credit Union for down payment assistance to home buyers who do not meet traditional financing parameters. Um, the housing fellowship was awarded 128,000 in home funds for a rental acquisition that will serve a larger family. Um, a portion of this award is Choto Reserve Funds. The housing fellowship is a certified community housing development organization through the home program. Um, and they are the only applicant eligible, eligible for 78,000 in Choto reserve funds. Um, Unlimited Abilities also submitted an application for rental acquisition, but was not allocated funds by HCDC. In accordance with our citizen participation plan, we've held a 30 day public comment period for the substantial amendment that ends today. And this meeting serves as an additional opportunity for public comment on the amendment. Um, we have not received any comments to date uh, with approval of the substantial amendment, we will submit the changes to HUD for approval and the projects can be begin shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Uh, Mohamed Traor again. I'll just make this one quick. Uh, it's really good to see more of the rental assistance and the down payment assistance. Uh, just the only question I'd have on this one is just the um, areas that these allocations would be made in terms of areas of the city within themselves. Uh, just really interested to know whether these will be concentrated um, for just uh, South District and um, downtown area or rather if this is more spread out around the city and um, hitting any of the west side of the city as well. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, so I would just like to draw attention to the fact that so the amount that's the amount of funding that's going to shelter house is uh, 300,000. Um, their executive director makes just over a third of that. She makes 130,000 a, a year. So uh, she makes $130,000 a year. And people in our community are going to be freezing to death very shortly. And <laughs> I think that's the problem with this town, to be honest, because, I mean, the city government, y'all drag your heels in regards to helping folks who are disadvantaged. And, I mean, if you look back to the way that y'all have just gone along with the downtown district, the way that they wanted to... to throw out uh, people who who were unhoused or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, 
this town with all the nonprofits, it's a really it, it's a really dirty system of scratching each other's back and then acting like, oh, we're such good people, even though people are literally going to be freezing to death. Um, and then to top it all off, because y'all are good Democrats who um, have a supposedly have a conscience, you you get really angry when people call y'all out for your shortcomings. I mean, we've seen this with Supervisor Rod Sullivan. That's Sullivan in a nutshell. And that sums up so many people on this council. Um, good liberals get offended when their good liberal sensibilities are questioned. And unfortunately for many people in this town, the, the I mean, they put their buddies, their cronies, et cetera. I mean, Mr. Mayor, that's what you've done with Supervisor Porter. Um, you've defended her throughout the abuses that she's thrown at TRC commissioners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The cronyism in this town is rotten. And I, I, I think that, I mean, you can see a microcosm of that here with this discussion. Um, it's, it, it's just very disheartening. Um, it, I mean, that's, that, I, it, we're trying to change that, like, slowly but surely, and it sucks because when we try to come up here and do things, y'all get personally offended, and you talk about how shitty we all are and how terrible people we are, and, I mean, it just sucks, but we're going to keep doing it. And I guess for my last comments this evening, I'm just going to say, do hybrid meetings. I mean, Mr. Mayor, tonight, it's been an embarrassment. I mean, the, the filibustering tonight did not need to happen. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Noah. Um, yeah, you already know the hybrid thing. Are you going to have a special meeting about making accessible meetings? I'm going to assume the answer is no, even though it, you could change that to a yes right now, but since the, <laughs> I'm not really expecting you to change. Um, yeah, so there's an extreme weather event happening in this city tomorrow. People don't have shelter. On their shelter house gets... 300, yeah, 300,000. 300, not even one... Sorry, not, like a, a third of a Chris Cornelli's salary. Yet their current winter, winter shelter is not open because they're off starting pay at $14 an hour. While the executive director makes 6K... <laughs> See, so, yeah, six figures. Yeah, no, I didn't say that right. <laughs> six figures while paying people fourteen dollars an hour, and it's it's a real mystery why they don't have enough staff. It's not a mystery. It's capitalism right there in our nonprofit industry. In in the yeah nonprofit industry because nonprofitism is an industry. That is the sad reality that it has become. People are going to get hurt tomorrow because of that greed, of not willing to pay people a living wage, so there's not going to be a shelter that normally is a shelter house. While the city has facilities in the past, y'all have opened up uh, Robert E. Lee. I know that's one place you can have facilities for shelter for people who need it tomorrow. And at least until shelter house figures out how to stop paying people, to stop, to not not pay people. Oh, I'm not even. Until the shelter house has actual able to have that if they pay people well they'd have that don't fund them any more money until they commit to giving paying all their employees living wages and more urgently is open your facility the cities of facilities up for people who need shelter tomorrow because they need it smart they need it today too but they especially need it tomorrow because there is an extreme weather event happening are you just going to let those people continue to not have shelter available to them Like, how, how, how do you just sit with that? So I want to know. Because right now you're just sitting with that. Or you, or, or you could open it. Say right now, okay, we're opening those. We're going to have it for people. We're going to go out there. We're going to give people shelter who need it. Because they need it desperately. They need it desperately. They need it desperately, especially tomorrow. Because, again, severe weather event happening that people are going to get hurt with in. Because they don't have shelter that you could be providing that currently is not being provided 
because of this. Not this is the because the shelter house or shelter house operates. Thank you. Are you going to have t shelter for people who need Thank it tomorrow? You. Thank Are you, you going to have shelter for who need it tomorrow? I will not be ignored. Anyone here. else want to that, have I, public comment? If people die, blood is on your hands. Thank I hope you. you know that. If you don't open up facilities, Thank that you. blood is all over your hands. Thank you. All over your damn hands. If you don't open your facilities up, there is no good reason you cannot commit to right now open the f those facilities up right now tonight. No good reason whatsoever. Thank you. Are you going Anyone to open else? Are there Anyone going to else? be facilities for those people who need shelter tomorrow? Anyone else is like there to going address to this topic? I don't see a hand, so I'm going to keep talking. Seeing no one. Or is there going to be facilities? Is a city I'll move going? The resolution. Is okay. there going to be shelter for people who need shelter tomorrow? Uh, no. Is the city uh, going to provide that shelter? Yes or no? We are. Are you? You're done. You know that. Oh, right? I'm not done. Because if you're not going to provide shelter. Is that enough? Go, what? Yeah. You've just. All right. Said I'm going to close the public enough. comment. Is there going to be shelter for those people okay. who need it tomorrow? Can I get a motion to approve, please? So move. Second. Is there going to be shelter for those people who need it tomorrow? Mims. All right, council discussion. No discussion. I Pro will definitely support this. I think, you know, we've got a lot of good organizations in this town who are, I think, as efficient as we can actually ask for in distributing this money. Um, and appreciate their assistance because um, certainly we can't do all this with just city staff. So it's good to see the various partnerships that we have, and I will be supporting it. Yeah, I also the see I'm saying, yeah, my other organization here are doing a fantastic job, and uh, I think that like public private partnership is really great and helping our city to reach out more communities. Yeah, thank you. Permanent supportive housing for people who are with who chronically experience homelessness is something that exists here. Um, there, there's one project at Cross Park Place that was the first built in the state. The set, the, the I believe that the three hundred dollars, three hundred thousand allocated here are are aimed at the second one, which is under construction now. Um, it's a it, it provides it ultimately provides permanent housing, permanent supportive housing with services. Um, for people who, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, would never otherwise be able to be housed. Exactly. No, and I would agree that housing first model uh, really is um, unique, and we were the first in the state. But beyond that, I'm happy to know that we're on our second uh, facility here in the city. Mm -hmm. All right. No more comments. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 17 is announcement of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, December 28th, 2021. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission, one vacancy to fill a six-year term. Board of Appeals, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. And we're at item number 18, and we welcome USG. Hi, Council. Um, we're still seeking feedback on our Homeless Week survey. Um, the link was in the last announcements that we sent you. Finals week is this week, and then winter break starts. Ellie and I will be out of town for the January 4th City Council meeting. Um, we'll see you when we return from break. And then for City Council meetings for this semester, um, we both have different school schedules, so we'll have to split up, split up our time at Council in a different way. So I'll send you a follow-up email about this. And then 
We don't really have any other announcements because our exec team and Senate haven't met the past couple weeks due to finals, but we will still be continuing on our initiatives over break and checking our emails if you want to stay in touch with us. All right, and wish you and the rest of um, USG the best in your finals. And we don't, I'm sorry, we don't have public comment at this time. Yeah. It's just USG. Um, we don't have public comment at this time. So you're not going to open that? This is another example of you. But I wasn't going to speak until they're done. Yeah. We, we, there is no we don't public do it at comment. This point. Also, agenda yeah. item number we 18. Only do, we only do it if we run out of time early. If, on the agenda, if, if the council wants it. Oh. I think that, I mean, especially with the disrespect that you all have given to this person. I have letters signed by over 30 people to read. I just was just hoping to do so before the end of the year. One of them is from an international group as well. If you want to submit it to council through email, we'll receive it. Thank you. I mean, Bruce, you could open it up. We're going to move on to item number 19, which is city council information. Any updates by city council? This is the time we can speak. You have a I think this is the time we can say something because we're leaving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I was really preparing like something to say, but for somehow, you know, I just felt sad throughout this meeting because I always see like black leadership in the community. <laughs> We cannot retain them. You know, they start working somewhere, but because they did not get the supporting tools, that's why they leave. And I'm sorry, at first I would, I would like to thank the public for electing me and, uh, you know, putting that trust on me that I'm going to do something. I, I think I'm, proud, I'm very proud about the time that I served with the council. I tried my best. I was on the public side all the time. Try to hear the public and what they need and try to, because I always think about myself as a public servant, whatever is going to benefit the public, I'm here to do it. I'm not here just to, to implement my own ideas. I'm here to see what the needs of the public so I can like advocate for. And that's what I was being doing on the bus like for like four years. Yeah, sometimes we come to a lot of agreement. And I think when I run, I said transportation, economic development for all, affordable housing. I think I done a lot of progress on those. Increasing the affordable housing fund to one million, that was proposed by me. Uh, also transportation, pillars and me, we just push hard on that in the beginning of my council and I'm glad to see like a lot of improvement in transportation and also like following the economic development will be the like having more permanent position and the, like changing a lot of temporary position to permanent positions and increasing the minimum wage uh, on the city for the seasonal employee to $15 an hour. And also like making the city really doing a lot of outreach. Now, like improving our outreach. Now a lot of people, even I asked Kerry Tracy how you, she starts seeing people come and try to benefit from all the grant that the city have for small businesses, for like we start seeing like minority people really engaging, uh, you know, with the city. Uh, I, yeah, it is sometimes we don't agree and that's healthy. I challenge a lot of time staff and council, but uh, at the end of the day, I really was trying to do, to do the good for the public and nothing, I don't have anything against nobody here, where as soon as I just finish, like, get up from this, like, setting, we all friend and, like, uh, here in the community, live together, neighbor, and that's what I have been feeling. But, Today, I just like really, 
I'm, I'm sorry to no one, you know, Dan, I'm going to say this, I've been supporting you on, like all the time. But today I felt like we've been undermined as black leadership. Do you know that this is the first time Meyer and Meyer brought him in the whole history of IOCT to be black? And instead of giving us the supporting tool to do our work, I just feel like we've been undermining and we've been like, you know, like, they making the job for us difficult to to continue, and uh, I, I wasn't like one my last meeting to be like this. And, and you know, my my husband overseas, my child is sick at home, and I'm still low income. By the way, I have five children and my mom, and you know. I, I, I do this as a volunteer. It's not, I'm not making money out of this. I try to serve my community. And I was wishing that you know, the public to give us like, the supporting tools to continue our work as black leaders. I've been in the council when the mayor was white and the mayor Burton was white, never seeing this happening, never seeing people come and just undermining the leadership like that. So I don't know, but. That's kind of thing that, like, make the people like me not even running it in or not doing this volunteer work because, you know, just no support. That's how I felt today. But I, I just want to say that also I have it that I work with all of you and with the staff. Sometimes I was very direct. I don't know how to sugarcoat things. Uh, I just don't want like people to take that you like personally. Never meant anything. I love you all, and I'm gonna be still around, and we're gonna continue like working together. I'm glad that I made all these connections, whether with the council or whether with the staff, and we're gonna continue. And I'm gonna come and telling you behind that podiums, so. Yeah, and thank you for the public for giving me this opportunity to serve them. And uh, I hope that I did something good. And maybe I will come again in the future. Thank you so much. It's been 12 years. And a lot's changed in 12 years. And, and I think some of your comments tonight, Maz, reflect some of those changes. The changes locally, the changes at the state, and the changes nationally. Um, we've become polarized. We've become very disrespectful. Um, and I, I think that's what I find the most frustrating is we can disagree and we can challenge each other, and we can you know, talk about these issues. But when people make it personal, when people, um, when people wanna talk and, and don't necessarily understand the process and then want to criticize and complain about what's done or not done when they don't understand process. It gets frustrating. Um, one of the things I've been concerned about over the last few years is, is how much harder it is to get people to run for office. Mm -hmm. And I think those are some of the reasons it is harder. People say, how can you put up with it? Okay. Um, It, I'll come back to that in a minute, but I, I do, I do want to say, and this is where I wanted to start, and I'm like you, Maz, this is not how I wanted my last meeting to be. Um, I'd written some notes today, and, and where I wanted to start was just with a really big thank you to the staff. We have an absolutely excellent, excellent city staff. From the city manager to our city clerk, city attorney, um, all the way through. 
They're experts in their fields. They work hard to give great service to our community members, to be incredibly supportive and helpful to council as we try to make the best decisions that we can make for this community. Um, they get criticized a lot, they, you know, th but they, they are good, they are excellent, they do hard work, and I just wanna tell them how much I appreciate all of them. But one of the things I've really missed, actually, uh, over the last two years has been our staff appreciation luncheon that we typically had had out at Terry Trueblood. And I really enjoyed that. I, you know, I would go to it and I didn't even usually sit down and eat. I would simply walk around, I'd introduce myself, I would talk to staff, I uh, would tell them how much I appreciated their work. I'd ask, you know, what department they worked in and, you know, there were the people there who would just, you know, come in, they'd been picking up trash or they'd been out working on the streets or they were working in the finance department, whatever it might be. But just to really sincerely and honestly tell them how much I appreciated the work that they did for our community. And then clear the tables. They'd say, oh, you don't have to do that. You have to do that. I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed getting to know people that way and tell them how much we appreciate all the work that they do. I went back through and looked and was trying to think about um, how many council members I've worked with over the 12 years. And I'm not sure if I counted it right, but I think there's at least 16. Um, started off when I took office in January of 2010 with Mike Wright, Virginia Bailey, Connie Champion, Matt Hayek, Terry Dickens, and Ross Wilburn. And Ross was one of the first African American members of this council. Um, now obviously working at the state level in the Democratic Party. And I figured there's been about 10 more since that period in time. And all different personalities, interests, um, and approaches to doing things. But it's, it's been educational, it's been interesting, and I have enjoyed it. I looked at the strategic, one of the things that when I was elected the first time that I ran on was the fact that the city did not even have a citywide strategic plan. And so it took us about a year and a half to get it done because the first thing we had to get done was hire a new city manager. And we wanted to wait till we got that new city manager before we started down the path of a strategic plan. And so we hired Tom Marcus and I would say, you know, some of the couple of the highlights um, in those 12 years is hiring two absolutely excellent city managers, um, Tom Marcus first and now Jeff Fruin. Um, also in the process, we've, you know, replaced a 30 plus year city clerk with Kelly, who's doing an excellent job. And I don't know, 20, 25 plus year city attorney with Eric Goers, who's stepped in without missing a beat. And they're great leaders uh, for this staff. I, I looked at, um, went back to look at some documents and I looked at the uh, 2011 excuse me, to 2015 capital improvement project plan. It was kind of interesting that 2011 to 2015 plan, 45% of that budget was for flood recovery and mitigation. We spent tens if not hundreds probably of millions of dollars that we got our own money, state, federal, and a local option sales tax. We decommissioned the North Wastewater Treatment Plant. We expanded the South Wastewater Treatment Plant. We bought out, I think, over 40 houses along Normandy. I was talking to Tracy Heights earlier. She thought the total buyout was like 140 from the floods. Built levees, replaced the animal shelter, um, de uh, elevated Dubuque Street, and put in a new Park Road bridge. We've done a lot in 12 years. Um, you know, Moz mentioned some of the other things. We've, we've had affordable housing um, groups and programs. Um, I think our first 14 point plan was, I don't know, six or eight years ago. We worked through that and we've just continued um, to go from there. But it's been the people, it's been the projects. I mean, more recently, obviously it's been 
you know, the Climate Action Plan, et cetera. But it, again, as Ma has addressed, it's, it's some of the negatives as we reach the end that are disappointing. Hearing some of the comments tonight about Shelter House and about Chrissy Canganelli's salary, you don't find and hire good people to do the hard, complicated work of leading an organization like Shelter House without giving them a good and fair compensation for their experience and their expertise. And so I would never apologize, nor should, do I think Chrissy should apologize for her salary. Okay. Um, they, are, they, they have a low barrier shelter. Uh, there have been recently some false accusations out there. They do not drug test. They do not do alcohol testing. They basically, it's done on the behavior of individuals. If they come in and they're intoxicated, if they behave, they can stay. And so the, the things that are coming out from some parts of the community starting to uh, really push negative messages about Shelter House and some of our other excellent longtime um, social service agencies, I think is really disconcerting. And I think the people who know and understand what's happening in those organizations and the positive things they're doing have to really make sure that we're promoting that. Janice, you mentioned the um, Housing First and they're on their second project. Um, that first one took 24 chronically homeless individuals and gave them a safe uh, roof over their head, a door that could be locked so they didn't have to worry about their belongings and then moved them to get more assistance um, as they got used to having social workers and nurses and psychiatric people in the building and made them less service resistant. We have to find a way to bridge the divides and the polarization that we find in our community and across our state and across this country. And we need to start here. And we need to start by holding ourselves accountable. We need to start by holding other people accountable who are not honest. We have to have the conversations. And I would challenge this council as they go forward, you need to discuss and find a way uh, and a process to keep the public comment on target. Um, we spent, I think, about an hour and a half tonight listening to repeated comments that had nothing to do with the agenda items. It was clear that the council is going to discuss the issue of meeting structure and, and how people can access the meetings, and you'll do that once you have your full new council in place, which is, for me, the, the process that makes sense. But when we have policies and procedures and time limits and that people are supposed to address the, the item on the table, I really think you have to talk about how you're going to enforce that as you go forward. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think you really need to talk about it with staff and how are you going to handle that. The public should be able to come here and in a timely manner get up to address the issues that they're here to address without an extra hour and a half being added to a meeting with the same message being repeated and repeated and repeated and oftentimes not even uh, relevant to the matter on the floor. I think people need to make an effort when there's those issues that people are frustrated about is to have those conversations outside of these meetings to try and help with the understanding of where we're at, what the process is that the council is talking about using. All right, and maybe that will help in terms of mitigating an, another meeting um, like we've had tonight. I've enjoyed my 12 years. Um, I'm, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be a change. It's, I'm, there's pros and cons. I was talking to somebody today. There's pros and cons about leaving. Um, but again, the last thing I would say is I just really want to thank the staff and I want to thank the public for electing me three times. And like others have said, not going anywhere. Going to be around. Happy to talk. 
and will continue to find ways um, that I want to work within this community. So thank you very much to everybody here and to the public. Any other items from council or comments from council? Thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you to you both. I've learned an enormous amount from both of you and really relied on both of you for, for council and um, coming up to speed and different perspectives and just um, being colleagues. Yeah, I, I spoke to both Susan and Moz before the meeting and, you know, expressed my appreciation for their work. And, um, you know, I think tonight did offer us with the, uh, the Schmid project a really, I think, great example of how when things work, it's really quite inspiring. So I'm, you know, I'm, I want to take that away from this meeting. Um, and so I'm happy that, you know, that coincided with your last meeting. <laughs> um, because that was a great example of, I think, how we try to, to bridge these divides. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of trying to work on that vision that we can share uh, so that we, we don't get lost in the things that divide us. Uh, we, ha we have a sufficient, the, the vision is, is compelling enough that we put, set those aside. And um, you know, I think we have a great example with, with what we heard tonight on the Schmidt and the work of the South District in mm -hmm. general. I have to say, Susan, that uh, come January and we're doing our budget discussions, I'm going to totally miss you and, and your financial savviness. I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll be, you'll gladly not be here. <clears throat> All right, moving on to item number 19, 20. Any updates from our city manager? Yeah, I'd like to um, address both Susan and Maz. Um, and I'll try to keep it, uh, keep it brief. Um, Maza here, you said something towards the end of your remarks tonight. You said, I hope I did something good. Um, you should get that out of your mind right now. You don't need to hope. You should know you did plenty good. Yeah. And if you need a list, just let me know. I'll be happy <laughs> to create a list of all the good that you did. Thank um, you. We had a talk earlier in, uh, or last week, and um, I just want to reiterate, um, you know, you, you challenged and pushed me quite a bit, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm confident that I'm a better city manager because of you um, and the 600-plus staff that we have. We're, we're a stronger, better staff, more responsive staff to the community because of you. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan, you're, you're the... Um, uh, the last remaining counselor uh, <laughs> from the from the group that I kind of yeah. came to the city with. So you'll, after you leave, uh, I will have experienced all new all new council members. Um, uh, you have always been a strong supporter um, of our staff, and you, you know you mentioned the employee lunch and always coming and engaging with staff, and absolutely we appreciated that. But um, there's. You know, one one way that you always showed great respect for staff, and and um, that's you were always prepared. It didn't matter the meeting, what else was going on. It didn't matter um, the item. It didn't you know whether it was parks or public works or whatever. You were always prepared, and that means so much to us as staff. It means so much to the 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 600 plus employees that work on those issues that that you know have a lot riding on on the council votes that we don't always think about and uh, i can tell you um, from the management team from all the staff um, we really appreciated that consistency um, and that hard work because i know what it takes to be prepared like you have always prepared and uh, um, i can't thank you enough for that Thank you for the time. Yeah. All right. Our deputy city manager. Well, it's hard to follow that. 
But I did want to uh, share, I had the opportunity to uh, attend the grand opening for Quick Star. I know uh, the council gets uh, uh, really involved on, on some of the big issues that come through the town but and forget maybe some of the small issues. Well, I can tell you they were a very enthusiastic group there and I was asked to uh, share their gratitude for the support that the mayor and counselors have given them um, during this project. And uh, I can tell you that the, the staff there are very enthusiastic. I think they were actually chanting uh, the city. It might have also been because Herky was there kind of cheering <laughs> along, but I'll take it any way we can get it. And I, I wanted to just pass that along, so. Thank you. So the attorney. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to echo uh, Jeff's comments for both uh, Maz and Susan as they uh, end their service with us. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here for more of the reception earlier other than to greet you both <laughs> very quickly uh, as a result of the scramble uh, with the precincting. Uh, and on that topic, I'd like to um, offer a special thanks to our Kirk Lehman and our planning department who really went above and beyond it in fantastic work in an area that I am completely incompetent in, <laughs> writing all these legal descriptions and getting the GIS mapping figured out. And without him, we would not have made it. So special thanks to Kirk. And again, thank you to you all. Thank you. Our city clerk. No, don't be shocked. I'm saying something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did talk to Maz and Susan a little bit earlier, um, but again, thank you both for your service and, and your support uh, in me and my role as, as clerk. Um, that was a big step for me and still learning every day. Um, and I do, I feel like I need to, to clarify uh, an issue. Um, the city does do verbatim transcriptions. We have since 1998. Um, I don't plan on discontinuing anytime soon. I, I find it's a, a good resource uh, tool to use when, when looking up things. Um, and I guess I would say for, for Mr. Cobble and, and Mr. Peterson, and if you could pass the word along to Ms. McGovern, um, if, if you need help navigating uh, the website or, or finding information because council archives is, is my business. If you give me a call, we can discuss transcriptions all you want. Okay. Yep. Sure. No, give me a call and we can talk about it. Give me a call and we can talk about it. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're at item number 21. I want to do that item. You want to? Can I get a... What? Yes, motion to adjourn my last meeting. <laughs> Second. <laughs> all right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>